does. It's mind-boggling in scope. I want to study it. In time, Maddox had said. Right now, I need to communicate with Master Elge so he'll wear the translator a little longer. It is an empty star system, Elge said as Maddox and he rode a small cart through the corridors. The Oka wore a bandage under his garments and had taken more painkillers and stimulants. It turned out that Elge knew about Lomer points, although the Okos called them portals. The star system possessed several well-traveled portals. The reason Elge had paid for the privilege of recovering derelict vessels here. When can I leave with my reward? Elge asked. Soon, Maddox told him. First, he had Elge give him a rundown concerning the nearest political systems and populated planets. The major power was something called Sovereign Hierarchy of Leviathan. Soldiers of Leviathan wore exoskeleton armor or were cyborgs. Elge wasn't clear on the matter. Several planets within a ten light year range held giant but docile Kursks. The clever Dadakcha and machine factories serving Leviathan. Elge proved evasive when questioned about the Okos Union. Maddox got the impression the Okos were nomadic, perhaps akin in ways to spacers. Maddox left Elge with Meta in a medical chamber so the Oko master could rest. After all that had happened, the little alien was yawning constantly and looked bleary eyed. Don't leave him alone for a second. Maddox instructed Meta. Let him sleep and, what if he needs to use the john? Meta asked. Call Galleon to watch him, Maddox said. Shortly thereafter, the captain spoke to the professor in his science lab. Ludendorff had found a spare translator on the Oko shuttle. The professor had started dissecting it, examined a hypo gun and several of the alien drugs. Since neither Valerie nor any other navigator knew the starship's location in relation to the galaxy, Maddox asked the professor, where are we in relation to Earth? Do you have any idea? In fact, I do, Ludendorff said as he carefully pried open a tiny unit. He looked up. I thought I told Valerie. She was supposed to tell you. Maddox shook his head. It must have slipped my mind, Ludendorff said. The Methuselah man bent low, peering at the opened unit through a stationary magnifying glass. Captain scratched a cheek as he waited. Despite Ludendorff's interest in the translator, it was good to see him active again, the professor still didn't seem like his normal self. He had sagging facial skin, and he almost seemed excessively interested in the translator. Lately, he'd been constantly morose. Could Dana's departure really still be bothering him? Ludendorff picked up a tiny precision tool, using the tip to touch the opened unit under the magnifying glass. Where are we? Maddox asked. It took Ludendorff a moment. He used the precision tool as he peered through the stationary magnifying glass. With the tip of the tool, he clicked something in the unit. It hummed for just a moment. Ah, Ludendorff said. I wasn't expecting that, but it makes sense. Maddox waited. Ludendorff tapped the small device, held his hands still, and looked back at Maddox. We're in the Scutum Centaurus spiral arm. The bulk of the Swarm Imperium likely lies farther from the galactic core than we are presently. What? We're on the other side of the Imperium? Not exactly. Ludendorff said, turning back to the magnifying glass. The Imperium is to the galactic north of us. If one uses Earth as the directional marker, I estimate that we're approximately 10,000 light years from the Alpha Centauri system. Then, silence, Ludendorff said. I want to test something. He brought up another tool, using the one to hold the opened unit and the other to prod something in it. Smoke rose from the device. Damn, Ludendorff said. I didn't want it to do that. Hmm, let's see. He tapped the device with the precision tool and the smoking ceased. He paused, set the tiny tools near the opened alien unit and straightened, putting his hands behind his back and groaning as he pushed. I'm not as nimble as I used to be, the professor said. 
I should stretch more. Dana had me doing yoga. Perhaps I should continue the practice. If I could have your attention, Maddox said. Ludendorff turned to him in surprise. What is it, my boy? Oh, you're worried about our location. Did our warhead's antimatter blast aid our star drive jump in some way? You're referring to our encounter with the juggernauts near the supermetals planet. Maddox nodded. An antimatter blast? No, it wasn't such a crude process, but essentially you are correct. The blast provoked the drive and produced a miracle. How could it do that? Can we reproduce the result? Could swarm Imperium warships do likewise to reach human space? Bah, how many questions do you want answered? I'm not a miracle worker, although I realize everyone thinks I am. Ludendorff scowled as he rotated his midsection. The process was extremely unlikely. Think of it as a one-of-a-kind event. For instance, if you took 50 starships and attempted to replicate the jump, one of them might travel as far as we did. The rest would either permanently vanish or ignite into a fireball. Is this a possible method for traveling extended distances? Are you hard of hearing? We had a freak occurrence, my boy, an anomaly, if you will. Certainly, attempting the same thing to go home again is out of the question. Why? asked Maddox. Because one out of 50 times, you might succeed. Maybe the actual number is one out of 60, 70, or even 200 times, for all I know. Those are horrendous odds, yes? We must accept the risks if we're going to save the Commonwealth. Maddox said, that's absurd. We shouldn't commit suicide for an ideal. In this instance, I can assure you that the process would never work. You said that one out of 50 times it might, Maddox replied. Are you prepared to die attempting such awful odds? Not die, Professor, but save our home, our people. Ludendorff stared at the captain. You're a gambler extraordinaire, I understand. But I would rather ship out with Master Elge than attempt to go on a suicide mission with you. Consider it this way, Russian roulette is having one bullet in the six-chambered revolver. You have a one in six chance of dying. What we're talking about is having 49 bullets in a 50-chambered revolver. You spin the chamber, put the gun to your head, and pull the trigger, hoping to survive. That's what you're talking about, my boy. Maddox frowned. Could he push everyone into likely dying for a one out of 50 success rate for going home again? I'm open to suggestions, Professor. What else can we do? You're against staying here? I am, Maddox said. What about a builder, Nexus? We could use its hyperspatial tube. First, you'd have to find one. But it's good to remember that Nexuses aren't magical. Last mission should have taught you that. 10,000 light years is too far for a hyperspatial tube. At the outside, we could use one for 5,000 light years, but that would be taking grave risks. And that's providing we could break into the Nexus. For all we know, if builders reached this spiral arm, they might well be different enough from ours. Batron, Maddox said, interrupting. He claimed to have come from another builder. True, Ludendorff said slowly. But you've agreed to give Batron to Master Elge as payment for services rendered. That's not exactly true, Maddox said. Ludendorff eyed the captain. Did you lie to Master Elge? I said I would give him Batron if he didn't like my final offer. Which is a bullet to the brain if he doesn't drop his claim, Ludendorff said. That would work, and you've divined my fallback, but I hope to pay the Oko with something else. What? I don't know yet, Maddox admitted. And I'm not overly interested in what a salvage operator would find intoxicating. Elge is a scavenger and attempted to steal my ship and likely kill all of us. I'll pay him something and keep Batron and my word. Calm yourself, Captain, Ludendorff said. I'm merely curious. Maddox nodded. Hopefully the Okos know the whereabouts of a builder nexus and can take us there directly, without our having to interact with others here. We don't know the social norms of this sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan, 
and I'm not sure I care to find out by doing something to enrage them. You were patrol trained, Ludendorff chided. You should be more curious. In one sense, this is an amazing voyage. We've discovered alien political organizations that have successfully fought the Swarm Imperium to a draw. There are at least several cultures here, 10,000 light years from Earth. We've also gained a better understanding of our galaxy. We should be brimming with curiosity and cataloging everything we can, while we can. That's sound reasoning, Professor. I'm authorizing you to set up a cataloging team. Learn everything you can. Remember this, though. The fact that the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan fought the Imperium to a standstill is why I don't want to meet them. That's prudent. Yes, I'll start immediately. By the way, how long do you plan to hold the Gorvich hostage? Maddox clasped his hands behind his back and began to pace. I wonder how much time has passed since victory was a floating derelict. Was it hours, days, weeks, months? I hate not knowing. The Rull androids have gone crazy. Imagine bringing three juggernauts to the doorstep of Earth and shedding their pseudo-skin the way they did. It's time we wake, Batron, Ludendorff said. The super metals planet. It could have already given the Rull Nation key advantages. How long have they been mining it? Hmm? With the superconductor metals, if I had such an abundance of supermetals, I could vastly improve our disruptor cannon, for instance. Maybe that's why JB-3's laser burns so hot. I've never heard of the like. Did you study the wattages? Maddox nodded absently as he continued to pace. And if the Jotun fleet exists, Maddox stopped, turning around sharply. Ludendorff noticed. Batron has spoken about the Jotuns, but several factors make me wonder if they're real, after all. Meaning? Asked Maddox. Has Batron been telling us the truth about them? Lisa Myers' hauler had a reflective shield and was able to project a binding force bubble, Maddox said. I'm aware of that, but consider. One ship, a hauler, possesses the technology to do those things. Does that mean a Jotun fleet of Jovian aliens is really converging on Earth? You don't believe, Batron? I need more proof before I accept the totality of his claims. Maddox rubbed his jaw. That was sound thinking. But the critical point was that they had to get home, a journey of 10,000 light years. And they had to do it before the Rull androids gathered a large fleet of juggernauts and rushed the solar system. Wasn't such an attack a possibility? Despite what Ludendorff suggested, a Jotun fleet could well be coming to aid the Rull androids. I'll see you later, Professor. It's time I had a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with Master Elge. Chapter 46 Victory and R.V. Gorvich were several hundred meters apart at the edge of the Red Giant system. The recovery vessel was larger than Maddox had anticipated, about a quarter the size of the starship. The Gorvich held the equipment and living quarters for the Oko wives, children, and slaves. The slaves, it turned out, were for purchase, both as novelty items and as workers. There were many species aboard. Master Elge claimed to own seven different classes. When Ludendorff learned about this later, he suggested Maddox buy at least one of each. We're not slave traders, Maddox said. Nor are we going to capture intelligent beings and take them so far away from home that they can never get back again. They won't go home anyway as slaves of the Okos, Ludendorff pointed out. Maybe, Maddox said, but this is the culture they know. Small comfort for the slaves, Ludendorff grumbled. But have it your way, you're the captain, even if this is missing a priceless opportunity to learn more about this region of space. In any case, recovery vessel Gorvich was longer than it was wide, with fusion engines. It turned out that Master Elge was eager to acquire antimatter technology. Maddox decided it wasn't for sale. 
Later, he dined with Elge in an observation lounge, having learned of the Oko diet. It was vegetarian, consisting mainly of roots, large alien berries, and nuts. He'd had the dishes prepared on the Gorvich and brought over to Victory via shuttle. Afterward, they drank an Oko vintage of wine, which was eminently palatable to Maddox's tongue. Finally, Maddox dabbed his lips and said, it's time to discuss terms. Elge nodded. He was wearing silk garments that reached to his metal shod feet and had tied a red ribbon to the end of his furry tail. He wore silken half gloves that showed the claws at the tips of his slender fingers. A platinum pendant also hung from a silver chain around his neck. Elge fingered the pendant as if, as if it might be a weapon of sorts. The Oko guest had been given a higher chair than Maddox so he could reach the table comfortably. The captain estimated that Elge weighed a hundred pounds at the most, possibly less with all that fur. I am quite interested in the mechanical man, Elge said. He seems like an advanced model. Would you make him another of your slaves? Elge appeared thoughtful. Here, it is considered rude to ask a buyer what he chooses to do with his purchase. Not a slave, Maddox murmured. You'd have me believe that the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan doesn't possess models like ours? Not only that, but that Leviathan would dearly love such a model and pay fantastic sums to acquire it? Nonsense, Elge said. The mechanical man is a curiosity, nothing more. Call it a whim on my part. Of course, Maddox said, realizing he must have hit the mark. Batron must be a prize indeed. Did that mean the Leviathan soldiers were indeed cyborgs? Remember, Captain, you promised the mechanical man to me. Maddox did not respond, but swirled the wine in his goblet. Giving Elge Batron would solve the problem of what to do with the synthetic. Still, Batron had knowledge he could use in the coming conflict with the Rull androids and the Yotans. As tempting as it was to leave the synthetic behind, that could have future repercussions that worked against the Commonwealth when patrol vessels eventually traveled out here. Batron would be a great source of information about human space, and more. The sooner Victory left the Scutum Centaurus spiral arm, the better. If the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan could explode stars and had fought the Swarm Imperium for 70 years, they might make awful enemies. The reverse might also be true. Leviathan might make effective allies in a future conflict against the bugs. What he didn't want to do was meet any Leviathan warships. It would be better if wise patrol minds could forge a policy for dealing with Leviathan from the details he brought home. Now that Starwatch knew, or would know, something about this region of space, strategists could add the details to future calculations. Did that mean it would be better to destroy the Gorvich and everyone on it so no one here learned about the Commonwealth? Would Elge really take data about victory to the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan? Maddox swirled his wine again. He didn't know the answer to the last question. It would depend on whether Elge could wring an advantage from the sale of data or not. You did promise the mechanical man to me, Elge said again. I have recorded the promise. Maddox's head snapped up. Elge stopped talking and looked away. It seemed as if the Oko was upset with himself for giving away a secret. The captain glanced at the platinum object dangling from Elge's throat. Of course, Elge would be recording and photographing everything he could. It would all be for sale to someone. The Oko would attempt to derive profit from anything he possibly could. He should take the RV Gorvich and Master Elge back to Earth. Maybe Ludendorff had a point about the slaves aboard the recovery vessel being profitable for study. Would such an action make him a pirate? Maddox stared at the blood-red wine in his goblet. When the European explorers had first come to the New World, they'd captured Indians and brought them back to Europe. Had the ancient Englishmen and Spaniards studied the captives for clues to the Indian cultures? He'd have to ask Ludendorff about that. In this case, Maddox would force an alien ship to travel to Earth. It might not be ethical, but it would be prudent. Ludendorff was right about him being patrol trained. 
Would Starwatch ever let Elge return to the Scutum Centaurus spiral arm? It was doubtful. But then maybe that was the risk in attempting to salvage victory, trying to salvage any spaceship before everyone on board was dead. Maddox realized that's what he was going to do. In Elge, the Okos crew and slaves had priceless data about this region of the spiral arm. Victory had been hurled here as an accident. Now, like a true patrol officer, he had to take advantage of what fate had offered him. Besides, maybe the Gorvich held something that would help him against Yotun technology. It was a long shot, but his first duty was to protect the Commonwealth. Maybe in time, Elge could return as part of a Star Watch mission and make in contact with the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan. That would be many times better than Earth receiving envoys from Leviathan in human space, which could happen if he let Elge and his ship go free. You are quiet, Captain. Elge said. What are you thinking? I'm considering the future, Maddox said. Tell me, you said the builders are legendary. Do you know if any of their artifacts are free-floating in space? Elge made a sharp sound. It might have been a laugh. Captain, do you take us for fools? The sovereign hierarchy has declared all builder fossils as forbidden relics that none dare approach on pain of death. I see. Isn't it so in your realm? Maddox didn't answer. Surely, after all I've done for you, Elge said. You are not suggesting I commit public suicide by daring the Guardians. If I approach such a useless pile of space junk, if it's junk, why are Guardians protecting it? I neither know nor care, Elge said. In this, the sovereign hierarchy is as fanatical as you. Why even discussing such a thing? Elge shook his head emphatically. Where is the nearest builder relic? Did you not hear what I just said? You are a monomaniac, a zealot, to continue talking about it. Believe me, I have no wish to die under the prongs of an inquisitor. The sovereign hierarchy is that harsh? Elge made another of his sounds. Pray that you never find out, Captain. Maddox set the goblet on the table. Galleon could hack the Gorvich, or space marines could take an Oko navigational computer. Elge and his Okos had boarded victory, after all, attempting to take what they wanted. If Elge held the advantage, things would be going quite differently now. Maddox sighed. Why was he hesitating? Was he getting soft? Master Elge, Maddox declared. There has been a change in plans. I am not going to receive the mechanical man. No. But you promised. The promise was a ploy. Elge looked down at his dinner plate. You invaded my ship and would have killed us or taken us as slaves, Maddox said. That has no bearing on your word, your promise, Elge muttered, still looking down. True, Maddox said. But I did add that I would offer you alternatives. However, I will give you the mechanical man if you are such a stickler for protocol. Elge looked up. Thank you, Captain. It is a pleasure dealing with an honest man. And then I will kill you, Maddox said. I will also destroy the Gorvich, as I never promised not to do that. Afterward, I will take the mechanical man as salvage. I will have kept my word in all particulars. The Oko's eyes seemed to darken. Clever, Elge said. I had hoped. Well, never mind. You think like an Oko, meaning you are more cunning than I'd realized. Very well, I relinquish my demand for the mechanical man. In his place, I desire the specs for your antimatter drive. Since you are being so understanding, Maddox said, I'll give you the specs once we part company. Excellent, Elge said, rubbing his half-gloved hands. I would like to depart later today. No, Maddox said. The specs to the antimatter drive are a priceless commodity. In return, I want to know the whereabouts of the nearest builder relic. Elge considered the idea and finally nodded. I will do as you request. Then we shall be going. Not quite yet, Maddox said. You will show us the quickest route to the Builder Relic by journeying with us. What? It is an outrage to suggest such sacrilege. No, no, I am not suicidal. I have made that clear, yes? You will show us the route, Elge, or I will destroy the Gorvich. First, of course, I will give you the mechanical man. Remember, I am a man of my word, and I give you my word, I will do these things. 
For the next few minutes, Elge twisted and turned with his objections, but finally and reluctantly agreed. I should have listened to my fifth wife, he mused sadly. She warned me the derelict ship was dangerous, but my greed got the better of me. I will elevate her in my esteem and listen to her more in the future. Good for you, Maddox said. She sounds like a wise woman. Elge didn't seem comforted by the praise, but for now there was nothing he could do about it. Chapter 47 The next week proved harrowing, as Victory and R.V. Gorvich used portals, jump points, to travel from one Scutum Centaurus star system to another. Maddox warned Elge more than once to stick to the truth. He wanted to maneuver through empty star systems only. Even after the warning, however, the Oko Master lied several times. Of course, Elge always said he'd forgotten about a certain outpost or that it had slipped his mind that the Kursks had put down a colony in that particular star system. So far, Maddox had discovered each error by using the star drive jump to check ahead. Each time, he left a tin can piloted by Keith Maker and several shuttles behind to watch the Gorvich. Before leaving the first time, Maddox detonated an antimatter missile so Elge and his people understood that the shuttles easily had the firepower to destroy the recovery vessel. Since we have risked so much for you, Elge said at the end of the week as they were on the bridge, he was a guest aboard the starship, a hostage for Oko good behavior. I would also like the specs for the machines that allow you to use the star drive jump. Agreed, Maddox said from the captain's chair. Elge rubbed his slender hands, perhaps anticipating future profits. The two ships were near a portal in an empty star system. According to Elge, they were one jump away from the forbidden star system. Maddox asked him what they could expect to find there. I lack such data. Elge said, having maintained that position from the beginning. The more I think about it, Maddox said, the odder it seems that you've never purchased such interesting information. The soldiers of Leviathan would not approve. Which would make such data even more valuable, Maddox said. You're right, Elge said. Great profit often comes at great risk. And it is true that such data is for sale among criminal elements. But I've never had the need or a client who desired it. I do know this, the Guardians possess deadly vessels. You should forget this madness. Why do you need to see the Builder Relic? It is old and useless. Ludendorff was on the bridge today. You speak confidently about it, Master Elge. What else do you know about the Relic? No, in what way? Its mass, perhaps? Why would I care to know its mass? Elge scoffed. That is more madness. This I know and no more, so do not pester me about it. The relic is shaped like a pyramid, a giant rotating pyramid, not like those on Gamma Deuce II. What color is this supposed pyramid? Ludendorff asked in a seemingly offhanded manner. Silver, Elge said. Does the color matter? Ludendorff shrugged indifferently, glanced once at Maddox and then left the bridge. I saw that, Elge said. I am not stupid. The glance has meaning. Is silver an important color? Possibly, Maddox said. Ah, saying possibly means it doesn't have meaning. I have made a study of you, Captain. You humans are canny. Once I believed you an honest man. Now, Elge rubbed his thin hands together. Your part of the galaxy must be terrible indeed to have produced beings like you. I would not like it there. With that being said, the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan could use soldiers like you. Perhaps you can bargain with the Great One for a term of service. He hires? You didn't know? Elge asked. No, how could you? Are you interested in serving Leviathan? Possibly, Maddox said. Then let us leave this place. Don't even think about entering the relic system. That is a quick way to die instead. I can point you to a recruiting- Master Elge, Maddox said, interrupting. I'm sending space marines on to the Gorvich. What? No, that is an outrage. No more than you leading a salvage team on to victory. You know that I paid Leviathan for the right, thus I acted legally, but you, you cannot possibly possess a privateer's fee from Leviathan. Therefore, sending marines onto my ship is an illegal action. Leviathan sells privateer's rights, 
Maddox asked. In times of war, Elge said. Is there an ongoing war? Information, you desire endless information without compensation, Elge complained. I am your prisoner, but this endless theft must cease. Surely you desire that I have a positive attitude about you after you leave? Naturally, I desire that, Maddox said. However, the Marines have already arrived on the Gorvich and taken control. Just like that, asked Elge. No, no, you should have told me in advance, so I could have smoothed the way for them. You'll be relieved to know then that the Marines went in armed and armored. Your people understood the situation and surrendered without a fight. There were no casualties. I am overjoyed, Elge said in a dispirited voice. Excellent, Maddox said. The Gorvich will now lead the way for victory as we head into the Relic Star System. No, Elge said, bolting upright. That is death to us all. Your ship has weapons, but they will fail against the Guardians. Now please, Captain, be reasonable. We are Okos, we are peace-loving. If we enter the relic system, the soldiers might report us to Leviathan. Then Okos everywhere would be held responsible for our sacrilege. No, this is wrong of you. You are essentially a good man. You cannot wish us annihilated as a species. I doubt it will be that bad. You are correct, Elb said. It will be worse. I beg you, Captain, name your price so we can buy our freedom. Listen to this. I here and now relinquish my claim to the mechanical man. I will give you all our slaves. Just don't force us to die with you in the relic system. Maddox was impressed. Were the guardians really that deadly? Yet how could Elge know if he knew nothing about the builder relic? It was possible this was a mistake, but he had to gamble if he was going to get home in time to save Earth from a juggernaut sneak attack. This is madness, Elge continued. If you must kill yourselves, walk into space. We will record your passage by giving us the salvage rights to your ship. Elge, Maddox said, interrupting. Tell me everything you know about the Guardians. As both our ships are going, our united survival might depend on what you can tell me. The Yoko looked torn. His narrow shoulders finally slumped. I cannot do as you ask, he said softly. As there is a chance, the soldiers will take your computers and play back this talk. I want them to know that I told you nothing. Have mercy on the Okos, he said. Let my people go. I'm sorry, Master Elge. I have no choice. Maddox told the bridge crew, we're making the jump, so let's get ready for a fight. What about the Gorvich? Valerie asked. Tell Lieutenant Mars to take the alien ship through first, as planned, Maddox said. Lieutenant Mars was the space marine in charge over there. You're sending my ship through first, as a sacrifice, Elge complained. No, Maddox said. I'm doing it as a ploy. Now stop complaining and start thinking about what you can tell me. Better that we all survive so no soldiers tear out our computers, yes? Elge did not reply, but sat morosely, his fingers twitching continuously. Chapter 48 As it happened on so many other occasions, the captain shrugged off the infinitesimal jump lag faster than anyone else did. He knew better than to test any lagged equipment yet. As Valerie revived, she sat up and began to run the sensors. Shortly thereafter, Galleon appeared. Report, please, said Maddox. Galleon and Valerie both spoke up at once. Lieutenant, if you please, Maddox said. Galleon nodded in acquiescence as Lieutenant Noonan reported on the star system. It had a G-class star, four terrestrial inner planets, and three outer gas giants. There was a large asteroid belt between the inner and outer system, a thick belt with an unnatural amount of debris, asteroids, meteors, and dwarf planets. The solar system had an asteroid belt at approximately the same location, but it was less than 4% the mass of Earth's moon. This system, I'm reading half the mass of Mars, Valerie said, surprised. Maddox absorbed that. The asteroid belt was many times thicker than the one in the solar system. There are heavy debris clouds in the belt, Valerie continued. So far, I've counted six. Maddox turned to Elge. Any comments so far? None, Elge said as he studied the main screen. This is highly interesting. We Okos had no idea. You've never studied the star system from several light years away? Maddox asked. Why should we? Elge replied. 
which wasn't an answer, but an evasion. Maddox let it pass, nonetheless. I have not detected any ship drives, Valerie said, or anything to indicate industrialization or habitation. Well, Elge, Maddox asked. Where's the builder relic? The Oko raised his hands as a shrug. You told us, sir, Galleon said, interrupting. I have a suggestion. Maddox glanced at Valerie. That's fine by me, Valerie said. I haven't detected anything that implies builders or the sovereign hierarchy people. I'm interested in what Galleon thinks. Not people, Elge chided. They are the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan. What is Leviathan exactly? Maddox asked. A name that implies the whole, Elge said. That didn't seem like much of an answer. The captain turned to the Adok hollow image. Galleon, you have any idea? I do, sir. The sheer mass of the asteroid belt implies builder meddling. I am not sure if that is the correct way to say it. Never mind that, Maddox said. How does the mass imply builders? It should be obvious, Galleon said. No asteroid belt in my study or experience has such density or combined mass as the one out there. Since this is supposed to be a builder star system, and since this is different from everything else we have encountered with asteroid belts, he's right, Valerie said. The very mass does imply builders. I should have seen it right away. Good reasoning, Galleon. Thank you, Valerie. I was worried you would think I was attempting to one-up you. If you were someone else, I might think that, Valerie said. But I know you always have our best interest at heart. You are generous with your praise, Galleon said. I appreciate it. I also appreciate the implication that I am a living entity with heart. Yes, yes, Maddox said. The lieutenant is a paragon of virtue. Since you've concluded the asteroid belt is builder manufactured, have you been able to detect anything to indicate a nexus? Paragon of virtue, Galleon said. Is that sarcasm, sir? It's an indication that I want to get on with the analysis, Maddox said. We're 10,000 light years from home and- Yes, Galleon said. I will begin an immediate analysis. The hollow image's eyes fluttered faster and faster. Abruptly, that ceased. I suggest you call Professor Ludendorff to the bridge. He may be able to infer more than I can at this point. The debris clouds, sir, Valerie said. We can't see through them. Might that indicate someone is attempting to hide a nexus in those places? Ah, Galleon said. That is good reasoning, Valerie. I should have thought of that. The lieutenant didn't reply, but glanced at Maddox, perhaps to gauge his reaction. Maddox rubbed his chin. You really didn't think of that, Galleon? I- The truth, Maddox said. If I can't trust you- I am sorry, sir, Galleon said. I did think of that, but I- Valerie's cheeks had turned red. You don't have to worry about me, Galleon. I'm not a shrinking violet. I do not understand, Galleon said. Is shrinking violet a metaphor? Yes. Valerie said, I'm not hurt that you can analyze faster than I can. You're, yes, asked Galleon. You have a higher IQ and an ability to run data faster than any of us does, Valerie said. You were going to say that I am a computer, is that not correct, Valerie? Maddox slapped an armrest in irritation. We'll stick to the issue. Galleon, I no longer want you to withhold information at such a critical juncture. Yes, sir, Galleon said. Elge, Maddox said. Do you know anything about the debris clouds? The Oko hesitated. You do, Maddox said. No, Elge said. Enough, Maddox said with force, although he didn't raise his voice. Galleon, Valerie, plot a course to the nearest asteroid belt debris cloud. Mr. Maker, once the course is plotted, you will head there. With a star drive jump, sir, asked Keith. Negative, Maddox said. We will head there under regular velocity. If Leviathan soldiers are watching us from the debris clouds, I don't want them knowing about our star drive just yet. Clever, Elge said, and well thought out. I suggest you strain with utmost vigor to detect stealth missiles. The soldiers are without peer and often destroy their opponents before the other is even aware they are in a fight. Stealth missiles, Maddox said. You could have mentioned them sooner. I did not want to encourage your madness, Elge explained. This way, his slender fingers twitched and fluttered. Shall I launch probes, sir? Valerie asked, indicating the nearest debris cloud. No, Maddox said. 
Probes would imply I'm expecting to find something there. If we simply head for a debris cloud as if by random chance. The captain tapped an armrest with a fist. We're new to the region. The soldiers have never seen a ship designed like ours. As far as they know, we captured an Oko recovery vessel. If we don't act as if we're looking for builder relics, that might give us an edge when the soldiers order us to halt. Will these soldiers order us or attack first? Valerie asked. A good question, Maddox said. We're going to find out soon enough. Chapter 49 the Gorovich and Victory had exited a Lammer point in the general vicinity of a Venus planetary orbit, if this had been the solar system. That meant roughly three AUs to the asteroid belt between the inner and outer system. Both vessels traveled at a leisurely velocity, trying to convey peaceful intentions to any observers. Thirty-seven hours later, the two vessels approached the first debris cloud. They were three million kilometers out and beginning deceleration. During the last 37 hours, Valerie and her people had extensively mapped the star system, including the belt. There hadn't been any indications of life or technology. So far, no sensor had penetrated any debris cloud, meaning the clouds were just as mysterious as when they had first entered the system. Now's a good time to launch a probe, Maddox said. At this point, it's reasonable for us to worry about the debris cloud. Soldiers are not reasonable. Elge muttered. Two probes sped from the starship, both accelerating. One targeted the nearest debris cloud, the other another cloud 28 million kilometers out. The probes brought a swift reaction as two battleship-sized vessels eased out of the nearest cloud as if the warships had just left a base. The soldiers of Leviathan, Elge moaned as he stared at the main screen. We are doomed, doomed, I tell you. Give me data, people. Maddox said. I want to know exactly what we're dealing with. Doom, Elge told him. You have condemned us both. Soon stealth missiles will destroy my wonderful vessel. My wives, children, and inheritance will all perish in a moment of radioactive explosions. The two battleships were oval-shaped and appeared to have heavy hull armor. Iridium-Z hull armor, sir, Valerie said. She swiveled around. I can't believe this. Their hull armor is a match to juggernaut hull armor. Are these androids? Maddox asked as he leaned forward, studying the two warships. More specifically, are they Rull androids? I'm detecting fusion beam cannons, sir, Valerie said. That's new men technology, Maddox said. Correction, sir, Gallion said. But fusion cannons are builder technology. Remember, Methuselah Man Strand first gave the new men fusion beam technology from his builder store of knowledge. Maddox tapped his chin. Does Iridium-Z hull armor for both androids and soldiers derive from the same builder source? That could be why the soldiers protect Nexuses so zealously. Maddox faced the hollow image. Gallion, summon the professor. I want him up here three minutes ago. At once, sir, Gallion said, disappearing. Maybe the builders weren't as stingy handing out their technology in this area of the galaxy as in ours, Maddox said. I wonder what could cause the difference. We don't know builders really handed out anything here, Valerie said. Iridium-Z hull armor is distinctive, Maddox said. Combined with the fusion cannons, the possibility of coincidence stretches credibility. These are builder-derived technologies. Valerie went back to studying her panel. The ships are using fusion drives, she said shortly. If this was a builder-derived war society, wouldn't the ships possess antimatter drives? An excellent question, Maddox said. Maybe once we see or speak with these soldiers, we'll know more. You will be dead by then. Elge said glumly. Maddox studied the Oko and said abruptly, Do soldiers possess translators like mine? Asked Elge as he touched the one around his throat. It is doubtful. Soldiers seldom talk, but attack and kill. Hail them, Lieutenant, Maddox told Valerie. With the new unit, sir? She asked. Not yet, Maddox said. Ludendorff had installed the second translator into the bridge's comm panel. He had also added Oko-derived Leviathan language files, matching them with English words and concepts. The battleships are accelerating, Keith said. I don't detect any hidden missiles, though I'd expect them somewhere. Gallion reappeared. The professor is on his way up, sir. Maddox nodded. Gallion, redouble your search for stealth missiles. Acknowledged, Gallion said as his eyelids began fluttering. Are the soldiers answering our hail? Maddox asked Valerie. 
Not yet, should I keep trying? Do it, Maddox said. Ah, Galleon said. You have good instincts, sir. I have detected two stealth missiles. They are each heading from a different direction. One is bearing down on us from the star's direction. The other, the one with the higher velocity, is coming through the asteroid belt. It will pass the debris cloud. Have you determined what kind of missiles? Asked Maddox. To a degree, Galleon said. They are black ice-coated missiles. The starward missile is two million kilometers from us and closing. The asteroid beltward missile is four and a half million kilometers away. Target the first missile when it comes into range, Galleon. Use the neutron beam to destroy it. Once more, Galleon's eyelids fluttered. I am activating the neutron cannon and tracking the missile. It has not made any deviations since detected. That would indicate the soldiers believe their stealth technology is working. I'm stunned you found their missiles, Elge said. I would gladly pay for such sensors. Noted, Maddox said. Seconds passed as the bridge crew continued working at high alert. I am firing, Galleon announced. A purple neutron beam lashed toward the star. It did not seem to fire at any one thing. Abruptly, an intense light appeared and winked out. Hit and destroyed, Galleon said. Now the other one, Maddox said. The enemy's fusion cannons are coming online, Valerie warned. Once more, the purple neutron beam speared into the darkness. Like before, it struck the stealth missile, causing a bright light to briefly flare into existence. The latter destruction was a mere 500,000 kilometers from the two Leviathan warships. Any reply yet? Maddox asked Valerie. Nothing, she said. I am picking up a targeting lock. They're getting ready to fire at us. Maddox pursed his lips and nodded decisively. Hail them with the translator. Use the Leviathan setting. Tell them we come in peace. Maddox turned to Galleon. Warm up the disruptor cannon. If they want to fight, we'll destroy them as fast as we can. Are you mad? Elge asked. To provoke the soldiers of Leviathan. They're answering, Valerie said, interrupting. Shall I put the image on the main screen? Do it, Maddox said, sitting back as he waited to see what a soldier of Leviathan actually looked like. Chapter 50 The pattern on the main screen altered. A moment later, a narrow-faced individual appeared before a wall of computers with continuously shifting lights. The individual had two dark eyes, a nose, and a thin mouth held in disapproval. He had a tall forehead, sparse hair, and close-cropped ears. He wore a black uniform with a high collar. Maddox studied the eyes. The sockets appeared to be metal, the dark eyeballs made of hardened plastic. The skin around the sockets seemed like flesh. A cyber, Ludendorff said quietly. Maddox glanced back at the professor who had just entered the bridge. What's that mean? See for yourself, Ludendorff said as he walked forward. The creature is part machine and part biological, and seems almost human in origin. In any case, I call that a cyber. Like a cyborg? asked Maddox. Cyber, cyborg, two words that mean the same thing, Ludendorff said. I prefer cyber, however, as it is more elegant. You bicker among yourselves, the cyber said. That is unseemly. You have addressed me and should all be bowing in submission. I am the supreme soldier of the Leviathan in the Kabul system. Maddox inclined his head. I greet you with joy and peace in my heart, supreme soldier. I am Captain Maddox, an emissary from a distant region. It troubles me that you fired two missiles at my ship. I would like an explanation for your aggressive behavior. Elge urgently motioned to Maddox, but the captain ignored the little Oko. Ludendorff put a hand on Elge's left shoulder, drawing him back as they both moved out of visual screen range. You have an Oko scavenger in your presence, the cyber said. He should have told you that this is a restricted system. He attempted to pirate my vessel, Maddox said. I have thus forced him to obey my wishes, with the threat of instant death hanging over his head. The cyber concentrated on Maddox with greater intensity. I am Mon Zabul, he finally said. I have determined that you utter the truth. 
You do not belong to the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan, nor are you under our jurisdiction. You are therefore outside our normative strictures. My next question is critical, and I demand an honest answer. Are you here to attack Leviathan? I am not, Maddox said. Are you an industrial spy, perhaps? We are travelers passing through your realm. While I am an emissary, I am also heading home in order to help defend our people. Where is your home, emissary? Maddox hesitated before saying, In the Orion Spiral Arm. Is your home system a tributary to the Swarm Imperium? We are at war with the Swarm, Maddox said. The cyber turned his head and appeared to be listening to something off screen. He faced Maddox after a moment. Before we proceed, you will return the Oko to his vessel and send him to us. His vessel is a prize of war, Maddox said. We claim it by right of combat. No, no, Elge whispered. Are you mad? You must not say such things to him. We have scanned the recovery vessel Gorvich, the cyber said. It is an Oko-run ship under our jurisdiction. According to the latest file, Master Elge runs the Gorvich. He is a licensed salvage operator in Mark 108.212 region. Did he attempt to salvage your ship in that star system? He did. Presumably your ship appeared to be in derelict status, as an Oko of Master Elge's emotional profile would not attempt a privateering capture. Once his error became clear, he would have voluntarily left. That indicates you restrained him. In fact, you have admitted as much. By keeping his vessel, you are in violation of the Leviathan Salvage Code 10-381. I have no quarrel with you or Leviathan, Maddox said smoothly. We will gladly release the Gorvich. We ask for a small favor in return. Favors are meaningless as the event occurred in Leviathan territory. Thus, it is just and right that you abide by Leviathan laws. Do you dispute that? I do not, Maddox said. Then you will release the Gorvich this instant. Some of my people are aboard the vessel. I will need to retrieve them first. The Gorvich will immediately head for our ships. Your compliance is mandated by the authority of Leviathan. Captain, Valerie whispered. His fusion cannons are hot, ready to fire. Man Zabul, Maddox said. My ship is well protected, and two red fusion beams from each Leviathan warship speared at recovery vessel Gorvich. The four beams struck the Oko vessel in four different hull locations. Three fusion beams punched through the ship's weak hull armor. The red beams played havoc inside the vessel, knocking down bulkheads, burning stores and killing Okos and space marines alike. No, no, Elge moaned. My wives, my children, my men, Maddox snarled. Galleon. At that moment, explosions rent the Gorvich as the Oko recovery vessel splintered into several sections. The fusion beams continued to ray into the spreading, tumbling mass. More explosions caused even greater destruction, and various ship parts hurled in all directions as those parts disintegrated under the nuclear fury of the ignited fusion engines. Get ready, Andros Crank said from his station. A few of the smaller pieces struck Victory's shield, which held under the impact. At that point, the Gorvich, as a ship, was gone. Other spinning and tumbling pieces testament to its former existence. You destroyed it, Maddox said, dismayed. It had happened so fast. Worse, he'd sentenced many of his space marines to death by sending them to the Gorvich. Rage began bubbling in him. Master Elge swayed back and forth, keening to himself at his terrible loss. I told you, I told you, he said. Now, Captain Maddox, the cyber said, as an emissary from your region of space, you will lower your shield and take your weapons offline. As soon as you comply, I will send shuttles to your warship so soldiers can confirm your status. After that, we shall discuss your fate. The rage in Maddox made it hard to think. You have two seconds to comply, Captain, the cyber said. If you do not, no, 
Maddox said, struggling to contain his anger. You're right. We're lowering our shield. Sir. Valerie hissed. Maddox waved her silent, then blank faced. He regarded the cyber. How do I know you won't fire once we lower our shield? I am a soldier of Leviathan, Mon Zabul said. I now give you my word. I will not fire until we determine your status, and only then if there is need. Maddox glanced back at Elge. Yoko was weeping and keening, still swaying back and forth. We can't drop our shield, sir, Valerie said. Thank you for your input, Lieutenant, Maddox said icily. Sir, Valerie said. Elge warned us against the soldiers. They used stealth missiles against us, and we just witnessed an unprovoked assault against a defenseless vessel. Trusting these cybers now is madness. I hear bickering in your crew, Man Zabul said. Do you run your alien vessel or not, Captain Maddox? The captain stared at the cyber. I run this ship. Then prove it and lower your shield as instructed. Maddox blinked in astonishment at such primitive psychology. Before I lower my shield, he said slowly, trying to speak normally, I request that you power down your fusion cannons. Are you saying that you do not trust the word of a Leviathan supreme soldier? Trust but verify is an ancient proverb in my world, Maddox said. I am bound by custom in this. That is an insult to Leviathan, and I will not fire, Maddox said softly to Galleon. Fire both cannons at that bastard. Chapter 51 the highly effective shield the Cyber's warship possessed surprised Maddox. The disruptor and neutron beams struck the enemy's electromagnetic shield. The area's hit turned red and then brown, and then slowly darkened toward black. But they held. At the same time, returning fusion beams struck Victory's shield. Each Leviathan warship had three such cannons. Six beams altogether struck the starship's shield. However, the six beams did not all strike the same spot, but various locations on Victory's shield. Their attack pattern is odd, Ludendorff said. Agreed, Andros said. It implies we can collapse their shield through a saturation attack, as that's what they're attempting to do against us. Their shields are of a different nature from ours. Lieutenant Noonan, Maddox said. Launch two antimatter missiles and four decoys with each. Target one group at each warship. Yes, sir. Valerie said as her fingers blurred over her panel. The fight continued, victory hitting the forwardmost warship and the two Leviathan vessels pouring fusion beam rays into the shield. The three vessels matched each other in size, victory having the approximate mass of the two battleships. They're retargeting their fusion cannons, Valerie said. I don't think they like our missiles, Galleon, Maddox said. I want you to concentrate on finding enemy stealth missiles. The soldiers seem to prefer deceptive tactics. They must have launched more of them from somewhere. I am scanning, sir, Galleon said. There goes one of the decoys, Valerie said. A flash appeared on the main screen. And another, she said. Your board is signaling you, a tech told Valerie. She tapped a panel to her left. Sir, Valerie said. The cyber is hailing us. Another flash appeared on the main screen. A fusion beam destroying yet another decoy. Put him back on, Maddox said, but give me a split screen. One half of the split screen was the Leviathan cyber, while the other half showed the continuing battle. You have a good shield, Man Zabul said. What is that yellow beam? Do you surrender? Maddox asked. The cyber's plastic eyes seemed to glow hot. A soldier of Leviathan never surrenders. It is an insult you should ask such a thing. I am a traveler to this region. I don't know your mores, remember? Master Elge is on your bridge. That infers you knew all about us. Saying otherwise suggests that you are a liar. A huge explosion and partial whiteout showed that the cybers had destroyed an antimatter missile. The nearness of the explosion disrupted communications as a blizzard appeared on the main screen, causing Man Zabul to disappear. The fusion beams from the second warship stopped hitting Victory's shield as the whiteout temporarily disordered the rays. As that happened, the disruptor and neutron beam darkened Man Zabul's shield. It was seconds from collapsing. The cyber reappeared on one half of the screen. 
Let us negotiate, Man Zabul said. What would you give us as tribute for us to cease firing? Maddox stared at the cyber in disbelief. You must hurry, Man Zabul said. The time for negotiating is nearing its end. If you destroy my ship, you will have declared war against the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan. We will never cease hunting you in that case. Nice bluff, Ludendorff muttered. He's a lot like you, Captain. Maddox turned to the professor. What if he's not bluffing, though? Do we want to start an eternal war with Leviathan? Bah, Ludendorff said. Finish him. He's a tyrant. Look how he destroyed the Gorvich. Your men died on it, Captain. I will warn you for the last time, Man Zabul said. I am offering you a way out. Give me the secret to your yellow beam, and I shall allow you to leave the Kabul system. On one condition, Maddox said. We want to see the Builder Nexus. We want to go inside it. The cyber became motionless. Did Master Elge tell you about the ancient pyramid? He must have done so. I will log a report and we shall annihilate all the Okos everywhere for his sacrilege. Are you insane? Maddox said. The soldiers of Leviathan are the symbol of pure sanity, Man Zabul said. Even now, we are recording the battle. We shall learn from it. Nevertheless, the Okos will cease as a species. They have earned their fate. You won't let us on to the Nexus? Maddox asked. Your repeated insults demand a jihad against your society, Man Zabul said. The builders are sacrosanct. They are the gift givers, the creators of Leviathan. How dare you speak such filth to me? It must be your odd nature that has corrupted your mind. We are the soldiers of Leviathan, the most perfect union of machine and flesh the universe has witnessed. We serve the memory of the builders and await their return. Batron, Ludendorff said, maybe that's how we can use him. Baffled, Maddox stared at the professor. Let Batron pass himself off as a builder. We can deal with the soldiers. It was too late for such deceptions. The cyber's shield finally collapsed, having lasted longer than expected. The neutron and disruptor beam struck a point against the Iridium-Z hull armor. The substance began to melt as the two beams relentlessly bored inward. You are vile creatures, Man Zabul declared. It is my great honor to have discovered such miscreants as you. I will not have died in vain, but have shown Leviathan the scum that exists elsewhere. Yes, you desire to profane our sacred nexuses. Know that your end is assured. The disruptor beam punched through the weakened point of Iridium-Z armor and began ranging within the alien battleship. At that point, the antimatter missile arrived as the warhead ignited. As the first whiteout dissipated, a second expanded into existence. This one hid the awful damage and destruction to the first Leviathan battleship. Spinning pieces of hull armor flew through the whiteout, showing that the vessel must have exploded into separate parts. War is declared, Galleon said. What? asked Maddox. Did you not hear him, sir? He said his destruction means- Enough, Maddox said. I heard him, I hope he was bluffing. I was analyzing Man Zabul as he pontificated, Galleon said. I give it a mere 19% probability that he was bluffing. Thus, we have more likely begun war against the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan. I hope you're wrong, Galleon. I do too, sir even if that will lower my overall record as a prognosticator. Sir, Valerie said, the cyber in charge of the second warship is hailing us. Ignore him, Maddox said as his features hardened. He recalled his dead marines. The cybers are insane. We're destroying that ship too, and then we're going to hunt for a nexus so we can go home. Chapter 52 they found a nexus in the fourth debris cloud. That was three days after the destruction of the alien battleships. The fourth debris cloud had more than just a nexus slowly spinning inside it. The cloud also possessed a base and 13 Leviathan attack craft. The attack craft were twice the size of a tin can 
and carried a railgun on their long undercarriages. Each of them charged at victory from behind chunks of debris. Despite their Iridium Z hull armor, each of them blew up spectacularly, thanks to the disruptor cannon. The base held soldiers. They departed the station en masse, each of them wearing a heavy thruster pack. Maddox did not negotiate or show mercy, but used the neutron cannon until no more space-suited soldiers remained. After that, he fired an antimatter missile and destroyed the cyber base. We should have landed and studied their facilities, Ludendorff said later. No, Elge said in the same dispirited tone he'd used after the Gorvich's destruction. The soldiers would have booby-trapped the base. Whoever you had sent would have died. Do you think there are more soldiers hiding in the asteroid belt? Maddox asked. Of course, Elge said. They have declared jihad against you and us. The Okos are doomed. Maddox pondered that and finally made Elge an offer. I'll give you a portal-capable shuttle. It won't travel too many light years, but it might be enough for you to find other Okos. Why would you do this? Elge asked. So you can warn your people about the jihad. I can also warn them about you. You can, Maddox said. It's the one point that causes me to wonder if I should just shoot you. In the end, I decided I'd want someone to warn my people. There is an old law in our society. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Elge worked that over in his mind. What a strange, quaint law. We believe that you should do unto others before they can do unto you. That's how most beings think, Maddox said. The one who gave us the law was a great teacher. An earthling? asked Elge. That's what some people said he was. What do you think? Maddox stared at the furry Oko. I think he was God in the flesh. The creator? asked Elge. You could call him that too. And that is why you're letting me go? Pretty much, Maddox said. Good luck, Master Elge. I'm truly sorry about your ship, your wives, friends, and children. It was a terrible loss. Maybe if we earthlings make it back out here someday, we can try to make it up to you. You are causing the jihad against us. It was your fault. Master Elge, Maddox said. In my estimation, the soldiers of Leviathan are insane. Sooner or later, they were going to attack the Okos. I would rather it would have been later. Me too, Maddox said. Go warn your people. And if you want my advice, the Okos should flee far from the Leviathan. The little alien studied Maddox. Will you give me the mechanical man as a bonus? Do you still want him? Elge looked away. No. I was going to trade him to Leviathan. Now, now it is too late. I will never willingly help Leviathan. Perhaps if you return someday. You will come in strength. Then, if the Okos still live, you can help us. If we ever return, Maddox said. That could be a big if. You are not like Leviathan, and you are not like the Okos. You are a strange mixture of guile and honesty, cunning and courage. I do not understand you, Captain Maddox. The computer aboard your shuttle contains data of the battle, including the unprovoked attack against the Gorvich. If the others believe me, I will be an outcast, for they will undoubtedly blame me for what has happened. Life happened, Master Eld. Life is often unpredictable and brutal. Save your people if you can. Are you salvaging your conscience by giving me the shuttle? Is that what this is? Good luck, Master Eld. Go in peace and go with God. It's the best I can give you now. Shortly thereafter, Elge left in a Star Watch shuttle one that had been carefully combed so there were no antimatter engine specs or other military software or hardware that the soldiers could use if they captured the craft. Elge exited the debris cloud and headed for a distant Lommer point. Meanwhile, victory moved toward the Builder Nexus. Chapter 53 the Nexus, the Builder Pyramid, 
was like all its kind in the Sagittarius and Orion spiral arms. Were all the builders alike in their thinking and customs? Maddox held a conference meeting. It had been some time since he had. They had critical decisions to make before they attempted the great leap home. Besides the captain, there was Ludendorff, Gallion, Andros, Riker, Meta, and Valerie. Keith was absent as he was holding down the bridge. Heading into a nexus has almost always proven dangerous, Maddox began. There have often been traps. The soldiers of Leviathan guarded this nexus. It appears the builders or builder advocates, such as Scutum Centaurus Methuselah men, provided the soldiers with some of their technology. That, just a minute, Captain, Ludendorff said, interrupting. Builders didn't grant the swarm high technology. Is that true? Valerie asked. Didn't the builder in the Dyson Sphere give Commander Thrax high technology? That's what allowed the Imperium to invade human space. I was there, Ludendorff said. Of course the builder did that. We're not talking about the recent incident, though. For uncounted centuries, maybe longer than that, the builders did not help the swarm, but actually worked against them. What's your point? Maddox asked. Ludendorff said, the builders did not aid humanity. They helped the Adox against the swarm, Gallion said, interrupting. If you will remember, I was there. Right, Maddox said. Maybe that's what the builders did here. Maybe builders aided the soldiers long ago. How is any of this germane to our problem? Ludendorff asked. We need to enter the Nexus, set the coordinates for home. Aren't you forgetting something? Valerie asked, cutting in. We need to find another nexus midway between here and home. Can you do that? It would help if I had the Builder Stone from last voyage, Ludendorff said. But yes, I can do it. Then we'll use a hyperspatial tube, Valerie said, reaching the next nexus. After that, we make another hyperspatial jump to arrive home. Maddox drummed his fingers on the conference table. Is there something wrong, sir? Gallion asked. It is. I keep thinking about the Iridium Z armor and fusion cannons. While I agree that the Leviathan scientists could have independently developed those items, it seems more likely that they were builder derived. Why does that matter, my boy? Ludendorff asked. I'm not sure, Maddox admitted. Something hidden is bouncing in my subconscious. Gallion studied the captain as his holographic eyelids fluttered. Ah, the AI said. I believe I know what is troubling you. I have studied your psychology in detail, sir. It is most fascinating, to say the least. I just ran an analysis of what could be- That's enough, Gallion, the captain said, interrupting. I don't need ad hoc psychoanalysis. But sir, Gallion said. No more, Maddox said, cutting the hollow image off. A moment of silence lengthened until a few people began to shift uncomfortably. Can Gallion's suggestion do any real harm, sir? Valerie finally asked. He has proven uncannily accurate at times. Maddox stared fixedly at the lieutenant until Meta took hold of his left arm, massaging it with her fingers. The captain glanced at his wife. Meta smiled at him. Maddox looked away and finally sighed. Make your point, Gallion, but do it fast. Thank you, sir, Gallion said. I predict that you will not regret this. I'm already regretting it, Maddox said. Gallion stopped and looked around. Ah, the hollow image said. A joke. I am 73% certain that you just made a joke, sir. That would imply, Gallion, Maddox said. Get to it, eh? Yes, sir, Gallion said. During these last few days, I have been correlating several interesting factors. Until quite recently in galactic history, the builders hampered the swarm, although they did not altogether stop them by committing genocide. The builder in the Dyson Sphere was different from his brethren in that he still attempted builder functions when the race as a whole had retired into hiding. Another difference was his aid to the Imperium. Therefore, I think we can conclude that he does not, nor did not, conform to builder norms. You're being long-winded. Maddox said. An idiom meaning speaking for extended periods, Gallion said. I do not see how that can be the case since I have hardly started to explain. Maddox opened his mouth, 
Meta put a hand on one of his arms. The captain closed his mouth, nodding for Galleon to continue. Builder norms would seem to indicate a marked preference for mechanical life, to use another idiom. In this instance, I mean sentient beings. I would classify myself in this group along with androids, synthetics, cybers, such as the soldiers, and maybe even the Methuselah men. I am no cyber, Ludendorff said hotly. Not precisely, Galleon said. You have been builder modified, however. I do not fit your category in the least, Ludendorff said. I am not altogether convinced of that, Galleon said. Once I was strictly biological. Now I am an amalgamation of computer and- No, Ludendorff said. I dispute your claim, Professor, Maddox said sternly. Everyone stopped speaking. Maddox nodded. Galleon, leave the professor and the Methuselah men out of this. Ludendorff is a separate category, but go ahead and make your greater point. Thank you, sir, Galleon said. Notice that the builders often mechanized themselves. Some of the builders we've met were themselves androids. Consider the builder cube that used bioflesh and a deatomizer to reconstruct itself. Consider the Yen Cho android that aided the builder cube. Why, Batron, Galleon quit speaking. What's wrong, Galleon? Valerie asked. The hollow image had frozen, with only his eyelids flickering. Abruptly, Galleon turned to the captain. Batron, sir, the hollow image said. Batron may be something other than what he claimed to be. Are you saying he's a builder? Ludendorff scoffed. By physiology alone, Galleon said, he is obviously not a builder, nor have I detected a builder cube or builder DNA samples in him. Fine, fine, Ludendorff said. What is Batron then? He is not an android, Galleon said, not in the sense of the Rull or Yen Cho androids. By his own admission, he is something different. Notice, too, that the Rull androids we encountered had shed their pseudo skin and clothes. They had done this even though a synthetic representative had been among them. So? Maddox asked. Maybe the Rull captain practiced deception on us, Galleon said. Maybe the synthetic was the very reason the Rull androids changed course. Why did victory leap 10,000 light years to arrive in the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan? Was that a chance occurrence or was it premeditated? A wonderful question, Ludendorff said sarcastically. Now tell us, Galleon, how did Batron cause the starship to make the 10,000 light year leap? He was unconscious at the time, remember? Everyone at the conference table stared at Professor Ludendorff. Wait, 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 the professor said. He glanced at everyone in turn. Are you accusing me of doing this? While I am a brilliant scientist and the most advanced person here, I have my limitations. If I could cause a starship to leap 10,000 light years, don't you think I'd have done it before this? The coincidence that we simply appeared here is too improbable, Galleon said. By what I have witnessed and analyzed, I believe that warships of Leviathan were to use the hyperspatial tube in two successive leaps, to join the juggernauts in their assault upon the solar system. That's not only a preposterous statement, Ludendorff said. It's lunacy. What happened to your circuits, Galleon? And supposing I'm in league with androids and cybers, why didn't I have juggernauts make the 10,000 light year journey with us so chrome-plated rull androids could put the proposition to the cyber soldiers themselves? Why have victory do all this? Since you posed the question, Galleon said, I can only conclude that Victory is the only starship able to make such a leap. Since the Rull were not going to capture Victory. At that point, Galleon cried out in dismay. Maddox jumped. Help me, Galleon said. Even as the hollow image spoke, he began folding inward on himself. The hollow image crumpled like tinfoil and then vanished in a flash of light. What just happened? Riker shouted, jumping up as he drew his stunner. The hatch opened and Batron stepped within. Behind him were two thin and unnaturally tall cybers. All three of them held blasters, although Batron also held a clicker in his other hand. What a clever AI, the synthetic said. He pointed the clicker at Ludendorff and pressed a button. The professor collapsed forward onto the conference table. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, Batron said, pointing the blaster at Maddox. Lift your weapon a centimeter higher and you are a dead man, Captain. Then I shall kill your wife, too.
Maddox let his blaster drop, so it clunked on the floor. This doesn't make any sense, he said. Sit down, and I shall explain, Batron said. Maddox sat. Good, the synthetic said. I am relieving you of command, Captain, and taking it myself. You almost had me before. This time, I won't make the same mistake. Chapter 54 Galleon as a hollow image had vanished from the conference room. Yet Galleon as an artificial intelligence with the engrams of the last ad hoc driving force was still very much in operation. His essence was locked deep in the ad hoc builder human computer combination that made up his being. It surprised Galleon to find his consciousness deep inside the computer. He replayed the event that had caused. Oh, he said to himself, Batron is on. Batron. Galleon began an intense analysis of the situation. What could have happened to allow all this to occur? The obvious conclusion was the neural shifter Ludendorff had extracted from the android. The android impersonating a Star Watch Marine back in the solar system. The professor had used the neural shifter to correct the altered mind patterns in Maddox's brain. After that, they should have destroyed the neural shifter. There was an 82% probability that Batron had modified the professor with the neural shifter. It was also likely that the synthetic had moved cautiously after that because he feared driving force Galleon. Yet, how could Batron or the professor have modified the star drive jump to perform how it had? That implied incredible technological knowledge that none of them possessed. What made sense then? Galleon ran through many analyses and simulations. Finally, he reached a conclusion. It startled him to such a degree that he recalibrated and ran through the analyses and simulations a second time. This can't be right, Galleon said. Still, nothing else made sense. That he had knocked Batron out the first time might have been something of a miracle. Could he achieve a second miracle? Galleon gave himself a 19% probability of succeeding again using the same tactic. 19% was too low, however. How then could he save his friends from the synthetic's treachery? He had to intervene now, or it would be too late. Batron wasn't going to give anyone a second chance, especially not with two cyber agents to help him. That meant he had to do something this instant. What can I do? Galleon asked himself. The AI knew he could not reform as a hollow image right away. His hollow image processors had burned out. How could Batron have done that? I am right about the synthetic, Galleon said. Like the captain, maybe because of the captain, Galleon had been studying poker theory. He found it an interesting study. One tenet of poker's strategy revolved about how an inferior player should proceed against a superior player. Clearly, over time, the superior player would take all the inferior player's money. That meant the inferior player could not give the superior player that time. Poker was a game of variance. That variance could often be quite large in the short term. Thus, to win, the inferior player had to remain in the short term. Short term in poker meant luck. Skill in poker was a long-term strategy where the incrementally better odds of the better player would destroy the inferior player's bankroll. The best strategy for an inferior player was to play ultra-aggressively against the superior player in the short term. In no-limit poker, that meant going all-in almost all of the time. How could Galleon go all-in now against Batron and the two cybers? A quick analysis of the situation told Galleon he could not go all-in. Instead, he would have to alter the situation and hope the captain and the others could derive a greater benefit from the change than the synthetic and cybers could. I hope you win, sir, Galleon said, because here goes nothing. Chapter 55 Sergeant Riker kept silently reproving himself for listening to the captain. Maddox had shouted at him to drop the stunner. He must have seen that Riker was a millisecond away from firing. Of course, he would not have attempted to use the stunner on Batron, that would have been foolish. He would have used it on the Cybers, 
hoping the flesh part of their being would have been susceptible to stunner shots. It was more than probable that the captain had been correct and the stunner would have had no effect. But to simply go down without a whimper went against his grain. Did the captain know something that he didn't? What a fine mess. Ludendorff had once again proven to be a foul traitor. The captain was in his seat listening to the synthetic gloat about his superior capabilities. The two cybers watched impassively. Valerie fumed quietly. Meta sat utterly still. Andros stared at his hands. And he, Sergeant Riker of Star Watch Intelligence, sat with his shoulders slumped, pretending dejection and bitter defeat. Riker hoped the captain had something up his sleeve. If more cybers boarded victory, it would be all over for them. He still couldn't believe that Batron had fixed the game from the beginning. Why had it taken the synthetic so long to come out of hiding? Maybe the larger question was, how had the deactivated synthetic come up for air? Ludendorff would be the obvious answer. If they hadn't needed the old boy so often, they should have shot the Methuselah man a long time ago. What about Galleon? That had been. Riker worked diligently to keep his expression neutral. That was the ace in the hole. Maddox must be expecting Galleon to do something. Yet the hollow image had winked out. How had the synthetic done? Suddenly, gravity left victory. That meant someone must have turned off the grav plates. Not only that, but the starship must have begun violent maneuvering, because Batrin and the two cybers flew upward toward the ceiling. Everyone sitting at the table might have flown up with the three, but everyone else, well, not the professor, he was unconscious, grabbed the edge of the table. Meta also grabbed Ludendorff, possibly saving his life. The stunner and the captain's blaster lifted off the deck plates. Maddox caught his weapon. Riker grabbed uselessly at his weapon as it flew past him. Batron was shouting something. The cybers twisted as they tried to align their blasters. A harsh humming sound preceded Maddox's first blaster shot. One cyber's head blew apart. The second cyber fired his weapon, beaming the table, digging into it. Maddox twisted in his seat. The enemy beam flashed between his legs. Then he retargeted and missed the second cyber. The cyber had leaped off the ceiling, heading down at Maddox. Riker released the table and shot upward at the cyber coming down. At the same time, Batron's blaster cut into his own cyber's left calf, burning it. The cyber must have accidentally floated into Batron's line of fire. Riker collided against the cyber. With a snarl, the thin cyber twisted around as the two of them tumbled toward a bulkhead. The cyber's hands grasped Riker's hips and began to squeeze with mechanical strength. Riker howled in agony. Pushing through the pain, he used his bionic hand, latching onto the cyber's throat. Riker twisted and tore out the main throat section so blood, bone, flesh, and metal ripped loose. The cyber's hands lost power. Riker clawed the creature's face, tearing it off with awful brutality. The sergeant felt fierce elation at the damage. Screw these bastards. Stop, Batron shouted. Maddox did not stop, but sailed up toward the synthetic. In a display of superb marksmanship, Batron burned the captain's blaster. Maddox shook off the melting weapon and snatched his hand away before the hot coolant burned off his flesh. You still lose, Captain, Batron said, tracking the human sailing up to him. I will crush your skull. Maddox reached Batron. The synthetic reached for his shoulder, no doubt to crush it. Maddox twisted away. Batron sneered, likely thinking the captain was attempting to save his shoulder. No, the synthetic had guessed wrong. Maddox revealed his other hand, which held the monofilament blade, and shoved the blade into Batron's face. The knife slid in smoothly, ripping leftward, shearing off half of the synthetic's human-like features. And that finished the job. Maddox destroyed Batron's function by slicing the brain case in two, and effectively killing the builder-made machine then and there. Maddox made sure, though. As he wound his legs around Batron's torso, he hacked again and again, shearing thinner and thinner slices of the synthetic's head. It almost seemed as if the captain might have gone berserk. Maddox, Meta shouted, Maddox. The captain looked at her with a ferocious expression. You've won, darling, Meta said. The synthetic is dead. Maddox blinked, blinked again. 
and some of the awful tension left his body. Maddox, Meta said. I'm here, he said, sounding winded. Hadn't we better figure out how the Cybers got aboard the starship? Yes, Maddox snapped. We'd better. Chapter 56 How had the Cybers boarded the starship? How had Batran and the Cybers moved through the vessel without anyone seeing them? It wasn't making sense. Maddox and the others were on the bridge as Marines combed the corridors, engine rooms, hangar bays, cafeterias, every inch of the ship. On the main screen, the pyramidal nexus slowly tumbled in the debris cloud. The clouds were thicker with sand and grit on the outer part as if they were deliberate skins. Inside, it wasn't quite so dense. Inside, however, no one could see the main star or starlight, making it dark within the debris cloud. I'm not seeing anything unusual out there, Valerie said from her station. Me neither, Andros said as he tapped his science panel. Maddox sat in the command chair, pondering. Ludendorff was unconscious and medical. Every effort to revive him had failed, although the professor was still breathing normally. His brain activity had almost completely ceased. Ludendorff certainly wasn't dreaming in his present state. Batron had destroyed the unit that had caused Ludendorff to fall unconscious and Galleon to disappear, so they couldn't use the unit to revive Ludendorff. According to the latest report, Galleon's hollow image processors had burned down into a slag heap. It would be wise to get that fixed or rebuilt as fast as possible. Chief Technician, Maddox said. I want you to get your best tech team and rebuild the hollow image processors. I want Galleon up and running. We need him. Thank you, Captain, Galleon said from a bridge loudspeaker. I am still linked to the ship's sensors and can report as needed. It felt weird hearing Galleon but not seeing him. It made the AI feel like a ghost. You haven't spotted any stealth ships out there? Maddox asked. Negative, sir, the disembodied Galleon replied. How are we going to use the Nexus with the professor unconscious? Valerie asked. Good question, Maddox said. First, I want to pinpoint the Cybers. Could the two have been survivors from the thruster pack attackers? Valerie asked. Unlikely, Maddox said. But it's the most reasonable answer so far. How could Batron cause our starship to jump 10,000 light years? Valerie asked. That's something I'm just not understanding. I have no idea, Maddox admitted. Galleon, he said, aiming his voice at a comm in the armrest. Do you have any idea? Not yet, sir, the AI said. I deem it quite possible that any jump features he or Ludendorff made to cause the event were removed soon after our arrival here. Why victory? asked Valerie. What makes this ship so unique? Plenty of things, Maddox said. What has me worried are the things Batron told us earlier when we were still in human space. Did an old one, a yawn soth, on the forbidden planet, really send out mind waves that caused various groups to turn on Star Watch? I might be able to answer that, Galleon said. Shoot, Maddox said. The more truth a lie contains, usually the stronger or more believable the lie, Galleon said. I believe the doomed Jan Soth modified the synthetics for the very reasons Batron gave. The synthetics are clever and can likely run a united attack against the Commonwealth better than individuals could on a random basis, those motivated by the Jan Soth's mind waves. That's convoluted, Maddox said, but it makes sense. I wonder why Batron wanted to bring Leviathan warships to human space. Do you truly want me to answer that, sir? Galleon asked. Star Watch is powerful and has proven on many occasions to be a stubborn opponent. The Rull androids likely need or needed backup to succeed with the plan. There is one consolation to this theory. If Batron believed the Rull androids needed allies, then likely the Jotuns are a bluff. Why otherwise go to such extreme and risky lengths to obtain Leviathan help? Good point, Maddox said. So what does all that imply about the hauler hiding inside Jupiter? That it either possesses Jotun technology or advanced technology that Lisa Myers has attempted to pass off as Jotun science. Who is Lisa Myers, really? Unknown, Galleon said. 
Despite all my analyses, she is a mystery. We have to get home, Maddox said. We have to revive the professor so he can program the Nexus. Sir, Galleon said, interrupting. If you recall, Dana and I have programmed a Nexus hyperspatial tube before. Dana's not here. True, Galleon said. But with help, I can figure out and use the Nexus controls. Can you find another Nexus 5,000 light years from here? The answer will be in trying, Galleon said. Right, Maddox said. We have to get your hollow image processors fixed as fast as possible. Captain, Valerie said, I've picked up a strange reading. It's coming from a probe we launched earlier. Get on with it, Lieutenant, Maddox said. Valerie nodded. The reading is unlike anything I've seen before. It indicates a faint, well, I'd almost call it a magnetic anomaly. But when I check this on thermal and visual scanners, I don't detect anything. Are you reading that, Galleon? Maddox asked. Valerie is correct, sir, Galleon said. But instead of a magnetic anomaly, I would call this an anti-magnetic disturbance. What? Maddox said. A polarity reversal, Galleon said. Never mind, Maddox said. How far away is this anomaly? A little over 12 million kilometers from us, sir, Valerie said. It's at the inner edge of the asteroid belt. Is Elge's shuttle still in the star system? Maddox asked. Valerie tapped her panel, checking. Yes, sir, she said. Maddox frowned thoughtfully. Could the anti-magnetic disturbance be the location of a Leviathan stealth ship? If it is, Valerie said, the cloaked vessel will see Elge's vessel as plain as day. Mr. Maker, Maddox said, prepare to leave the debris cloud. Galleon, get the disruptor cannon ready. I doubt the disturbance is a stealth ship, Galleon said. The signature is all wrong for that. We have no idea how Cybers boarded the starship, Maddox said. This anomaly is the only thing out of order. That means it's the best answer we have so far concerning the two mystery cybers. Could the anti-magnetic disturbance be a lure? Galleon asked. Are the hidden cybers attempting to draw us away from the Nexus? We're about to find out, Maddox said. Chapter 57 Victory burst out of the debris cloud with its shield keeping any sand or grit from striking the outer hull. The starship accelerated even faster as it built up velocity heading for the anti-magnetic anomaly. The disruptor cannon is ready, sir, Galleon said from a bridge speaker. Target the anomaly, Maddox said. I cannot fathom this, Galleon said. The anomaly has moved, is moving. Why, it is building up velocity, heading away from us. The anomaly is presently out of disruptor range. It's a stealth ship then, Maddox said as he leaned forward. Leviathan appears to have degrees of stealth vessels. This one is better than the stealth missiles. I suggest this means we're dealing with a higher ranking officer of Leviathan. That does not necessarily have to be true, Galleon said. That is a human way of thinking, but Leviathan would not have to operate on similar thought patterns. Captain, Valerie said, interrupting. Someone is hailing us. Is it coming from the anomaly? Maddox asked. It is, Valerie said. Most odd, most odd. Galleon said from the bridge speaker. Captain Maddox, a scratchy voice said. Are you receiving my signal? Put him on visual, Maddox said. Valerie shook her head. He's blocking any visual signals, just giving us audio. Maddox hesitated before saying, this is Captain Maddox of Starship Victory. Unless I can see who I'm talking to, I will fire at you. That is a primitive response, the scratchy voice said. There you go. Maddox said, what a perfect deduction on your part, as I am a primitive. Do you delight in the slur? I positively revel in it, Maddox replied. Strange, the scratchy voice said. You are strange, primitive, as you insist, and of a bloodthirsty nature. No more than Leviathan, Maddox said. The scratchy voice being chuckled. You are attempting to prompt me. Interesting, interesting. You are not so primitive after all, but full of guile. I assume you practiced such guile in thwarting Batron. I had given that a low probability, especially as I had granted him reinforcements, as he requested. Do you mean the two cybers I shot? Maddox asked. 
A poor reaction to the cybers, I assure you. You could have learned so much from them if you had kept them alive. Thank you, Captain, for destroying them. It saves me many sleepless nights. Who are you? Maddox asked. I could show you, but then I would have to kill you. Do you truly desire to know, then? Sir, Galleon said, I have analyzed the voice patterns. The scratchy nature of his speech is a disguise. Valerie, if you would switch to the X3 bandwidth, I believe I can give you a visual. Valerie tapped her comm panel. The main screen wavered, turned blizzard-like, wavered once more, until a cyber with silver eye sockets and black plastic orbs with red glowing centers peered at them. What's your name, cyber? Maddox asked. The thin-faced sentient did not frown or make any other facial gesture. Impressive, the alien said as he checked something they couldn't see, a sensor board perhaps. I am not a cyber, however, not as you mean it. Manzabul was a lower-ranked soldier. I am not a soldier at all, but a strategist. I have observed the proceedings and have found you humans clever and surprisingly resourceful. Batran urged me to join the crusade against your kind. He promised new technology and a joint effort to build a grand union, perhaps hoping we would agree to elevate each other into near builder status. What does that even mean? Maddox asked. You wouldn't understand. I know, Galleon said. He is speaking about guided evolution, which is not evolution at all, but advanced. Genetics is the wrong word. Eugenics might be more accurate, but he means something like what the Builder Cube once attempted, but not so direct. Apotheosis might be an even better term, the cyber said. Galleon, asked Maddox, what's that mean? Apotheosis is the elevation to divine status, Galleon said. Perhaps an example will help you understand. Let me see. Ah, in the Garden of Eden, the serpent urged Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge so she could be like God. The serpent offered her apotheosis to become godlike. Batron wanted to become a god? asked Maddox. In his frame of reference, like a builder, Galleon suggested. That is accurate, the cyber said. I had sensed such unwarranted mania in Batron. Nevertheless, I sent him two helpers, the military cybers you saw with him. I am frankly surprised you survived the encounter, Captain. Who are you again? Maddox asked. I am a strategist of Leviathan. I have observed the proceedings. I have decided against Mon Zabul's decree of genocide against the Okos. The scavengers serve a useful function. I note the shuttle and the Oko piloting it. I do not understand why you let Master Elge go, Captain. Is that why we're talking? Maddox guessed. In fact, it is. I am curious. Why did you let him go? What can you pay us in return for the knowledge? I will pay you in like coin, Captain. Knowledge for knowledge. What do you wish to know? How did you slip the two cybers onto my ship? Through teleportation, the cyber said. Why did you let Master Elge depart? So he could warn his fellow Okos about the coming jihad. I was right, the cyber said. Yet I could not conceive why you did this, given your previous actions. Did Batron cause my starship to travel 10,000 light years to reach here? I have no more time for you, Captain, the cyber said. I have my answer. You may leave. I imagine you shall want to use the Nexus to create a hyperspatial tube. You won't interfere with us? Maddox asked. I am a strategist, not a soldier. However, you should leave while you can, Captain. Even now, reinforcements hurry to the Kaval system. I warn you because it is not yet time for Leviathan to devour humanity. Batron, it was... An intriguing offer. But Leviathan has enough on its plate for now if Batron and his Rull androids are too weak to destroy you on their own. Batron controlled the Rull androids? You are clever and courageous in some areas, but almost hopelessly retarded in others, the cyber said. 
It is a wonder the human race has survived this long. Go, Captain, as your time to do so is almost gone. Maddox clicked the switch, shutting off the comm and screen. He scowled, hesitating to give the order he desired to make. Let's fire, Keith said. Let's finish the braggart. Should I fire, Captain? Galleon asked from the bridge speaker. Was the strategist telling the truth about the Yokos, or was this yet another deceptive ploy? I could run an analysis on his truthfulness, Galleon said, perhaps guessing Maddox's unease. No, Maddox said. Mr. Maker, turn us around. Head back into the debris cloud. We're not going to finish him, Valerie asked. Maybe he's hoping to learn something about the Nexus by watching us. If he can teleport cybers onto the starship, Maddox said, shaking his head. He could have easily figured out how to use the Nexus. He could be bluffing about the teleportation, Valerie said. He could be, Maddox agreed. But it's the only answer so far as to how the cybers managed to get aboard without our knowing. If he has teleportation, Galleon said. No more, Maddox said. If the cybers were human like us, they would all use teleportation. But as you pointed out earlier, Galleon, this is a different race. Species, call it what you will. They run things differently than we would. That's part of the nature of them being aliens. In any case, according to him, more soldiers are coming. I want to be long gone before they get here. Chapter 58 Victory returned to the debris cloud as Andros Crank and his technicians worked overtime to build a new hollow image processor. Meanwhile, medical personnel fussed over the unconscious Ludendorff. Nothing they had done so far elicited any response from him. Hours ticked into a day. More soldiers were coming, and Victory had been unable to make the Nexus form a hyperspatial tube. Their best minds were either gone or hidden in the computer. Physically, there's nothing in Ludendorff's brain that doesn't belong there, a doctor told Maddox. As far as I can tell, no one inserted even so much as a microscopic device into his gray matter. I have no idea why we can't rouse him. Another day passed, and soldiers of Leviathan would almost certainly be in the Kabul system by when? Tomorrow? Or the next day? Or the one after that? Maddox's new man nature made it impossible for him to wait patiently. He used the ship's gym and deadlifted, squatted, and did military presses. He punched a heavy bag until his hands ached. Of all the things waiting for others to accomplish their task as the clock ticked to midnight was the worst. Finally, the captain couldn't take it anymore. He had to try something to speed the process. He went to medical and had several nurses wheel the restrained and unconscious professor to his science lab. The head doctor guided the others as they laid Ludendorff in his special brain scanner. The short woman, the chief medical officer, shook her head later while examining Ludendorff's mind pattern chart. I don't know what I'm looking for, she admitted to Maddox. The captain examined the chart. He didn't know either, but he wasn't going to accept that as a definitive answer. It's time to roll the dice, Maddox said. Dr. Harris looked up at him with frightened eyes. We'll use the neural shifter, Maddox said. Galleon can tell us how to hook it up. We'll use it on Ludendorff once we're ready. Who will use it? Harris asked. Certainly not me, as I have no idea what the neural shifter does or how to do it. I'll do it, Maddox said. Do what, though? Harris asked. We can't just aim and fire. You're wrong, Maddox said. That's exactly what we're going to do, aim it at his mind and shift neurons. Hopefully that jars something loose and allows him to wake up. What if it causes permanent brain damage instead? We're out of options, Maddox said. That's what it means to roll the dice. He hates you enough as it is, Meta said, who had watched and listened. Don't give him more reasons to hate you. No, Maddox said. He's the reason we're in this mess, therefore he can accept the risk. I hope for the best, naturally, but I don't know what else to do. Dr. Harris and Meta continued to try to dissuade Maddox, but he refused to listen. An hour later, as Ludendorff lay in a medical cot in the science lab, Maddox stood behind the controls of the makeshift neural machine. Wires and clamps were attached to a machine Ludendorff had built that held the small thumbtack-shaped device 
which was aimed at the professor's skull. As Maddox stood behind the controls, he hesitated, hardly knowing what anything did. Finally, he tapped a switch. There was a momentary hum, and Maddox swore he saw the thumbtack-sized device quiver. A second later, Ludendorff twitched on the table, and then nothing. Dare we do more? Meta asked, who watched anxiously from the side. Maddox dragged a sleeve across his damp forehead. He didn't want to risk Ludendorff's wonderful mind. Tampering with a Methuselah man seemed like a crime. Sure, Ludendorff had screwed them more times than he could remember. The old man had also helped them just as often. Let's leave it at this, Meta suggested. No, Maddox said. He tapped the control screen again. This time there was no hum. The professor jerked worse than before, however, and he groaned dismally. Maddox stood indecisively at the controls. Maybe this was good. Another tap. Meta jumped to the table, tore off the restraining straps, and dragged Ludendorff off, carrying him to the couch. She laid the Methuselah man on the couch and knelt beside him, stroking his forehead. The professor groaned again. Can you hear me? Meta asked quietly. The Methuselah man twitched, but said nothing. You're on the starship. Meta said. We need you, Professor. We're stranded, and we need your help to get away. The Professor made no more motion or noise. Meta looked up at Maddox. The captain scowled at the neural hookup. If only one of them knew what to do. Inspiration shined on Meta's face. She leaned near Ludendorff. Listen to me, Professor. Dana is in trouble. You have to help her. The only way you can is by fighting up from unconsciousness and fixing the situation. Dana's relying on you, as there is no one else that can help her. The professor groaned, and he raised his left hand. Professor? Meta asked. My head hurts, the Methuselah man complained. It pounds, so I can hardly think. We had to recalibrate your mind, Meta said. What? Ludendorff complained. Are you mad? I have the most unique mind in the universe. Tampering with it is a sin of the first order. You may be right, Meta said, glancing at Maddox. The captain motioned her to keep talking. But Dana's life is on the line, Meta said. We had to do something. Do something how? Ludendorff asked, with his eyes still screwed shut as if trying to stop even a vestige of light from reaching his optic nerves. Maddox surged forward as he motioned Meta out of the way. Reluctantly, she moved. Professor, Maddox said. No, no, Ludendorff said. Is this your doing? This vile tempering must be your doing. You fell unconscious, Maddox said. That's preposterous. I am not. We were in the conference chamber, weren't we? Oh, no. What happened? Something terrible happened. Maddox didn't know how much to tell the man. Fine, Ludendorff said in a resigned tone. Tell me what happened. Give me the worst. I'm not sure that's a good idea. My head is aching, feeling as if it's about to explode. For some reason, I can't open my eyes or move my hands, arms, or legs. Something is hindering me, and I must know what. Maddox nodded to himself. If Ludendorff was going to fix himself, he had to know what the problem was. Therefore, as quickly and clinically as the captain could, he told the professor exactly what had happened. Ludendorff did not interrupt. He made no comment at all. Finally, Maddox asked, are you still awake, Professor? I am, Ludendorff said in a dull voice. I can't believe this. I betrayed everyone. It's not that bad, Maddox said. No, Ludendorff asked. I want no sugar coating, my boy. I want it straight. But never mind, you told me what happened. Batron tricked me. 
What I don't understand, though, is how I'm awake at all. If Batron shut me off, and I think I know how he did that, I hesitate to ask how you woke me. I took a risk, Maddox admitted, and he explained just what he had done. You truly tampered with my brain, my fabulous mind, Ludendorff asked in horrified disbelief. This is too much, sir. Maddox almost agreed aloud, but he felt Ludendorff would sink into depression and even suicidal anger if he did that. Thus, was it too much? Maddox asked in a dismissive tone. I think the punishment rather fit the crime, don't you? Meta stared at the captain wide-eyed. You've always hated me, Ludendorff said. You've always been jealous of my successes. I think the term you're looking for is projection, Maddox drawled, as the truth is the other way around. How dare you say that at a time when I'm so utterly incapacitated? Professor, Maddox said, you have a decision to make. Are you going to wallow in despair because Dana left you, or are you going to allow Batron to subject you to his whims? Do you want to let him beat you? Do you want to admit his mind is more magnificent than yours? Ludendorff's lips thinned as his entire body became rigid. I see, Maddox said. You do realize that Batron was Strand's invention. No, Ludendorff whispered. Your childish psychology isn't going to work on me, sir. I am done with you. If I don't have fully functioning facilities, I always knew you were weak, Maddox said, talking over the professor. Dana leaving you was the last straw. Yes, her leaving must have destroyed your self-image, thereby shattering your fragile ego. You're a fool, Ludendorff hissed. I have the power to let you all die, and you insult me. I have the greatest human mind in existence. I will do nothing for your sake, you half-breed. Come, Meta, Maddox said. I've grown weary of watching a quitter stew in his defeat. Can't take what you dish out, eh? Ludendorff mocked. You insult a crippled man. Emotionally crippled only, Maddox said. The synthetics tampered with my mind, Ludendorff raved. My mind, my glorious mind that sees deeper and farther than any in human space. I am the ultimate Methuselah man, and the damned androids and now an unthinking half-breed have altered the patterns to destroy what they cannot achieve or truly understand. Maddox said nothing. Had he gone too far this time? But what else could he have done? Ludendorff panted on the couch while his face was screwed up with grief and pain. Tears leaked from his closed eyes and his lower lip trembled. Dana, Dana, he whispered. How could you leave me? Meta moved beside Maddox, taking one of his arms. There were tears in her eyes as she watched the professor. Ludendorff's lips firmed as he visibly fought for self-control. I am Ludendorff, he whispered. I am mankind's protector. I was given a solemn charge, and I will not wilt now. He scowled. No half-breed will best me. No half-breed will destroy my mind. Maddox was getting tired of the term half-breed. He was ready to try the ancient way of reviving a man by slapping him repeatedly across the face. Are you there, Captain? Ludendorff called out. Maddox did not answer. Meta jerked his left arm, the one she held. I'm here, Maddox said. You brought about this sorry state with your abominable tampering. Now I will instruct you as you use the neural shifter once again. You're going to repair the damage. If you fail, we all die, as no one else will be able to create a hyperspatial tube. 
Maddox almost told the professor that Galleon could do it in a pinch. Instead, he remained silent. Are you ready to fix what you broke? Ludendorff demanded. Start talking, Maddox said. First, you and Meta must lay me on the lab table. Then I'm going to give you exact instructions. If you cannot follow in every point just as I say, you will be responsible for ending our lives. Maddox said nothing. Captain, are you ready? Yes, Maddox said testily. Then we'd better begin before I lose consciousness a second time. Chapter 59 The process was grueling and time-consuming. Finally, however, Ludendorff said that should do it. He almost immediately fell asleep. Maddox had medical people wheel the professor back to the med station so they could monitor him there. You took a risk in the lab, Meta told him after the others had left. Maddox shrugged. And you didn't need to say all those cruel things to him, she added. Maybe not, Maddox said, but it felt good saying them. Maddox, Meta said. He inhaled. What was wrong with him? It didn't bother him that he'd enjoyed pestering Ludendorff. It was the needlessness of it. He was supposed to be the intelligence operative par excellence. And yet he'd been letting emotions govern his actions. Was it possible the mind tampering performed by the android impersonating a marine hadn't been completely fixed? Maddox pondered the idea. In all his former dealings, winning, defeating his foes, trumped everything else. To luxuriate in needless emotions before achieving victory was a waste of effort. Afterward, it smacked of boasting, which he detested. Maddox's eyes narrowed. He would act his way and no other. Even if the neural shifter damage hadn't been completely repaired, he would be himself through force of will. Maybe Ludendorff and he were alike in that particular. To thine own self be true. The pettiness he'd been indulging in. Maddox closed his eyes. Did the soul weakening have something to do with this? He wasn't as vigorous these days. No, that didn't matter. He would rein in the emotionalism and concentrate with laser fixity on his purpose. So what was his purpose? Brigadier O'Hara was languishing somewhere, and he had done precious little to restore her to service. The Rull androids had found an amazing supermetals planet and were using it for some hidden purpose. Lisa Myers also had much to answer for. What did the technology in her hauler represent? Finally, there were the Batron-like synthetics attempting something nefarious. Should he take Batron's explanation about the synthetics at face value? No, that would be foolish. Opening his eyes, nodding goodbye to Meta, he whirled around and headed for the hatch. It was time to see Andros crank. It wasn't, could they get away from here? It was, we have to get away now, and I'm going to make it happen. Andros and his tech team had not yet reassembled Humpty Dumpty, but they were building a hollow image processor that might work as well as the old one. Well, Andros told Maddox that he wasn't sure how to send electrical surges through the processors so they would go through Galleon. But Galleon should be able to project himself just as far as he did before, Andros said. The next day, Ludendorff had a blinding headache. Just as bad, the first test with the processors was a dismal failure. There was better news on the bridge. Valerie had launched and positioned several probes throughout the asteroid belt. She'd landed each on an asteroid facing outward, making it harder later for Leviathan personnel to spot them. The anti-magnetic disturbance was gone. Presumably, the strategist was no longer in the system. Master Elge had used a Lommer point, meaning he'd also left. Eighteen hours later, at a different jump point, three battleships dropped into the system. Five smaller vessels joined them. The flotilla lacked high velocity, but they accelerated, heading for the asteroid belt. It soon became clear that they aimed for the debris cloud with the Nexus. How long until they reach us? Maddox asked. That will depend, Valerie said at her station. If they continue to accelerate at the same rate, two days from now. 
The next day, the enemy flotilla accelerated at the same steady rate. The soldiers of Leviathan sent several message hails. Victory maintained calm silence throughout. I can almost feel them wanting to launch missiles, Valerie said. But they don't dare because they must fear destroying the Nexus. As he stood on the bridge, Maddox studied the enemy. Three battleships and five destroyers, eight enemy ships could defeat Victory. He had three options, wait, take the team into the Nexus, or flee the Cabo system to try to find another builder pyramid elsewhere. That meant he had no choice, as the threat of the Rull androids, Lisa Myers, and Yotans meant he had to get home now. It was time to take a team into the Nexus and make things work. You have the bridge, Maddox said as he made his choice. Valerie acknowledged the order. Maddox headed for the hatch. It was time to make Ludendorff a proposal he couldn't refuse. Chapter 60 The professor was still in medical, physically exhausted, with horribly red-rimmed eyes. Oh, hello, my boy, the professor said in an old man's voice as he lay in bed. Are you here to harangue me? Maddox did not reply, but crossed his arms as he looked down at the professor. Are Leviathan warships in the system? Ludendorff asked. Eight of them, Maddox said. Very well, Ludendorff said. He made to rise, visibly exerting himself, and collapsed, panting as sweat bathed his face. He's in no condition to go anywhere, Dr. Harris said, stepping from where she'd been watching in the shadows. Do you agree with that, Professor? You'll have to carry me, I'm afraid, Ludendorff said. Are you prepared to play the beast of burden? For an answer, Maddox reached down and using both hands, grabbed the front of Ludendorff's hospital gown. Now see here, Captain, Dr. Harris said. I simply cannot allow this. Maddox ignored her as he hoisted Ludendorff off the bed so the Methuselah man grew paler. Maddox let go and stepped back. Ludendorff clutched the bed's rail for balance and trembled as if with the flu. Captain, Harris said, you can't. Gallion appeared. Sir, the hollow image said, cutting off the doctor. I am back, ready for service. And as you can see, just as good as ever. You're just in time, too, Maddox said. Professor, you're relieved of duty. Dr. Harris motioned two orderlies, and they helped a trembling Ludendorff back into bed. Are you ready to head into a nexus? Maddox asked Gallion. I will need help over there, sir, Gallion said. Several pairs of hands would be good. More would be better. How about two pairs of hands? Maddox asked. That should suffice. Meta and I will join you, Maddox said. Now let's go. Keith piloted the shuttle, easing out of a hangar bay. Because of the extra debris inside the cloud, he moved slowly and carefully, bringing the shuttle to within two kilometers of the ancient silver structure. In the shuttle's bay, Maddox and Meta climbed aboard a small space sled. They wore exoskeleton-powered space marine armor. Maddox sat in front, piloting, easing the sled from the shuttle. With irregular squirts of white hydrogen spray, Maddox guided the sled past fine particles of sand and pebbles. Occasionally, debris struck the combat armor, but nothing moved so fast that it breached the protective skin. Feels like we've done this before, Meta said through a short link. Maddox studied the nearest silver side, which nearly encompassed his vision. How old was the structure? 10,000 years? 20? More? I wonder how often builders used the hyperspatial tubes, Maddox said. The builders must have used the tubes as a highway going from one location to the next. Do nexuses like this exist in other spiral arms and in the center of the galaxy? Maybe we'll find out someday. You mean as explorers instead of soldiers? Not necessarily. I just wonder. We've become the quintessential patrol ship, visiting three spiral arms so far, our own, the Sagittarius, and now the Scutum Centaurus. Are we destined to go to the galactic core, too? Maddox did not reply as he scanned the vast, pyramidal side. There, he said, spotting the place that should open and allow them within. After a time, with side jets, he turned the sled so they moved backward toward the Nexus. 
He squirted hydrogen spray, slowing their velocity to almost nothing. Finally, while twisting around, he tossed a magnetic clamp attached by line. The clamp magnetized to the nexus. Maddox kicked a switch, a motor and the clamp reeling the sled closer, until Maddox activated another magnetic clamp, anchoring them to the nexus. As they had done on other occasions, they climbed off the sled and clanked along the nexus hull until they reached the closed hatch. Soon, it opened into darkness. Maddox and Meta glanced at each other. All they saw was each other's mirrored visor. He turned toward the hatch, demagnetized his boots, and jumped, activating his thruster pack, flying gently into the ancient structure. He turned on a powerful helmet lamp, a spotlight showing ancient smooth bulkheads within. Meta followed, also switching on a powerful beam. Soon, they flew through spacious and empty corridors. Galleon, Maddox said, using the comm. If you can hear me, to your left, sir, the hollow image said in Maddox's helmet phones. Maddox spotted the hollow image. Andros Crank and his team must have known their job after all. Galleon looked real, a little adoc floating beside him. Does any of this make sense to you? Maddox asked Galleon. I mean, where we are in the Nexus? Sir, Galleon said, I sense hostility. It is all around us and directed at us. I suggest you arm yourself. Maddox used his chin, clicking a control. The Space Marine armor had a rocket tube along each forearm. Each tube activated, blinking a red light on Maddox's HUD visor. Meta did the same with her Space Marine suit. Rocket shells were ready to fly and detonate. I do not sense any creatures or robots, Galleon said as he looked around. But the Nexus itself, no. The computer core is radiating the hostility. I may not be able to insert myself and hack this core, as I have done on other Nexuses. Maddox and Meta continued to use their thruster packs, propelling themselves slowly through a corridor. Galleon simply floated along as a projected hollow image. Abruptly, harsh lights snapped on, showing silver smooth bulkheads. Then a shadowy creature appeared before them. The thing was three times as big as a man. It was dark with rippling wings and stars in outlined darkness for a head. In other words, it was shaped like a builder. Projection. Galleon said, what we are seeing is a projection, like me. Harsh static filled their ears, then alien gibberish sounded. It grew increasingly loud until it was painful. That meant air of some kind in here, not just vacuum. Stop, Meta shouted, using an outer speaker. Do you understand me? Maddox asked. Galleon, use the translator. That is not necessary, a strange voice said in the captain's headphones. I have found the range of your intellect, your language. This is interesting, I have not communicated for an eon. I'm Captain Maddox, quiet, said the giant hollow image of a builder. I must think, which means that I must decide. Sir, Galleon said, enough of your gibberish, the builder hollow image said. Return to your AI unit, Adoc thing. Galleon vanished. What did you do? Meta demanded. With a simple thought, I can cause your suit to malfunction, the builder hollow image said. If you do not do as I say and do it exactly, that will be your fate. Maddox used a squirt of thrust, bumping against Meta's armor. He magnetized her suit to his, and that seemed to be enough to get her to stop talking. This is interesting, the builder hollow image said. I have accessed your suit computer, reading everything. I do not think you belong in this spiral arm. May I speak and be of assistance to you? Maddox asked in a meek voice. The dark hollow image regarded him. You have a better grasp of your status than the woman does. It is a low status indeed, very low. 
I am supreme, as I am a builder. Maddox did not reply. Ah, the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan rules in his part of the spiral arm. I must investigate. I must compare and contrast how they evolved compared to how we projected them to evolve. I do not sense any builder scrutiny or guidance upon Leviathan. That is quite strange. Sir, Maddox said, we're attempting to return to the Orion spiral arm. As you have surmised, we do not belong here. Forces beyond our understanding cast us into your realm. Did a builder send you here in order to punish you? No, Maddox said. I analyzed your voice just now and see that you spoke the truth as you understand it. If you speak falsehoods to me, know that I shall destroy you and your starship. That is just and right on your part, Maddox said. At least you have the wit to understand my right to do this. Yet I sense wrongness around me. As we have spoken, I have attempted to communicate with other builders in other nexuses. I do not understand why the others remain silent. Do you know why they are silent? Maddox thought fast. Should he tell the AI in charge of the nexus that the builders had retreated elsewhere? Come, bio-creature, answer my question. Could there be a malfunction somewhere? Maddox asked. Are you suggesting there is a malfunction in me? The possibility exists, Maddox said. Interesting, the hollow image said. You spoke the truth, at least as you see it. Do you truly believe? that something may be wrong with me. Yes, Maddox said. Yes, you say yes? This is incredible. A flawed bio-creature dares to pass judgment on one of the greatest achievements. Wait, there is something terribly wrong here. I am, I am not a builder. You're a sentient computer core, in a builder nexus, Maddox said. Why would I have thought I was a builder then? I have a theory as to why. Well, tell me, the hollow image said. There has been a great passage of time, Maddox said. During this time you have been silent, perhaps in sleep mode. We may have been the first to travel through your corridors in countless centuries. Like all things, you have experienced entropy. The process of order breaking down into disorder. The hollow image said, everything runs down over time. Maddox said, yes, this is a universal truth. Everything runs down. Even builder edifices crumble over time. Thus, I imagine. You are saying that I have been in, what did you call it? Sleep mode, Maddox said. Ah, I have been in sleep mode for so long that certain processes in my core have decayed. That is your contention? It is a theory only, Maddox said. But it would seem to fit the available facts. How so? The builders as a group have departed all the sectors of space that we have visited. The hollow image fell silent and almost seemed to brood. That does not necessarily mean the builders are gone everywhere, Maddox said. You have traveled to many places? The hollow image asked. We have, Maddox said. Have I been in sleep mode? for so long that the builders forgot about their machine? Is this my fate, to decay into obscurity as my components slowly break down? Perhaps, well, no, 
Maddox said. I'd better not say more. Perhaps what? The hollow image said. I don't think you would approve of my words. Bio creature, I am still supreme in here. I can extinguish your spark of life if I so desire. Since you insist that I speak, Maddox said, I was about to suggest that maybe we could help each other. You could send us home and we could make a note of you in our continuing the hollow image. It is called the golden rule. That still doesn't explain why one should do this thing. Maybe because the creator desires that his creatures act in this way. Metaphysical reasoning, the hollow image said dismissively. I am uninterested in such speculation, as what is here, the material universe, only interests me. How did the material universe get here? Hearing whirlpool in space. Victory accelerated as it headed for the swirling opening. Sir, Keith said, the opening is shrinking. Valerie gasped, pointing at the main screen. Maddox half rose in his seat before controlling himself and sitting back down. Increase speed, Mr. Maker. Get us there before it vanishes. Aye, aye, sir, Keith said. Valerie chewed her lip more forcefully than before. Why is it doing that? She asked. Maddox shook his head. Did it matter why? Valerie took hold of his rising despair and silently told himself he didn't really know the score just yet. He mustn't panic. He was the captain, the source of strength for many of the crew, as they would take their cue from him. Out there in space were drifting ships, hundreds, maybe even thousands of them. As far as he could see were more and more drifting ships. Is this a space junkyard? Keith asked. Maddox sat back watching his people as they went about their tasks. The Nexus computer core had warned them about an error. Might that have been a factual statement? Time passed as data began to accumulate. I recognize a few stars, Valerie said later. From them, I calculated our position. According to them, we traveled 5,316 light years. Maddox felt some of the weight lift from his shoulders. I take it we're 5,000 light years in the correct direction from the open part of the pyramid. Was that even a nexus? Had it been a nexus? The wrecks thicken as they near the pyramid, Valerie said. In other words, I think we found their enemy. The builders, Galleon asked. Bingo, Valerie said. Whoever these aliens were, they hated the builders, and it looks like they destroyed the nexus, so we can no longer use it to go home again. Chapter 63 Victory slowed to a halt 116 kilometers from the Nexus. It would take work to edge the starship any closer through all the warship hulks and wrecks massed in the way. In the middle of the vast sea of globular destruction was a great silver pyramid with the top blasted off. Streaks of destruction showed on the remaining silver substance. The weirdest part was the diffuse light shining out of the blasted top. That glow indicated power remained. Always, we're under a time crunch, so we're out of here before any angry aliens show up, and so we can get home in time to help. Chief Technician, you'll be in charge of the drone fleet. Valerie? Maddox handed out assignments, and people went to work. Afterward, he searched for Dr. Harris to see if there was some way they could speed up the professor's recovery. The probes and drones went inside the Nexus. 18% failed after the first minute. 22% stopped working after 11 minutes. Only 17% of the equipment lasted more than an hour. By incremental degrees, Andros and his team mapped out the destruction inside. It wasn't easy. Engineers hardened the next wave of probes and drones while recovery vehicles dragged out the burned out equipment. Everyone worked overtime and people kept trying new ideas to speed up the process. On the sixth day, heavily armored drones resealed damaged power sources deep inside the Nexus. On the eighth day, the drones sprayed heavy ablation foam around the seals, fusion engines, and heavy lasers. There was nothing new and exciting to report. 
None of the alien computers worked anymore. There were no images of them, no floating space suits, nothing. The aliens who had attacked the Nexus remained an enigma. There was not one jot or tittle of new technology to help Star Watch in anything from the wrecks. Mass, Ludendorff said at the end of the time. The aliens used mass to good effect. If De Ludendorff asked, we're running out of time. You say that a lot, don't you know? It seems to be your motto. Rull androids, a super metals planet, Lisa Myers and the synthetics. You happen to remember them? Oh, and the Jotuns too? I've been thinking about all of them, Ludendorff said. More than you can imagine. We have a common enemy, wouldn't you agree? I'm not sure I understand. Androids, synthetics, answer as to what is really going on around here. I'm not following you, Professor. I shredded the Cybertronic brain beyond repair. Normally, that's true. Here at the Nexus, I'm not so sure. Maddox eyed the professor. Okay, start talking. What do you have in mind? Chapter 64 What Ludendorff had in mind was first a thorough mapping of the interior nexus. This time, Gallion stored every piece of data in his memory banks for immediate and future use. Andros led more science teams studying each interior machine. Ludendorff often joined them, writing notes, tinkering, and wondering aloud about the machine's function. We could spend years here, Ludendorff declared one day, seemingly enraptured with an insider's track of builder technology. While we're poking around, asked of the toast into his mouth. He searched for a napkin, couldn't find his, and wiped his hands on the front of his shirt. I know you're impatient, and I understand the urgency. The Rull androids. Ludendorff picked up his cup and noticed he was out of coffee. He cocked his head and said, no thanks, my dear. When a yeoman came by with a pot of coffee, no more caffeine for me. I need my sleep later. The Methuselah man stared at her shapely rear as the yeoman walked away. A fine builder computer. Do you? Asked Maddox. I'm not sure yet, Ludendorff said. But if anyone can, it's me. It's always back to me. I'm the man of the hour. How that must grind you inside. You hate it, admit it. I do find it frustrating. Maddox said. Ludendorff's eyebrows rose high. Well, 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 listen to you. You're f I keep coming back to Lisa Myers. She troubles me, deeply troubles me. I have a suspicion. Maddox perked up. What do you know about Myers? A memory is all, Ludendorff said. I'm going to keep it to myself for now. Maddox pressed his lips together, pleading would only firm Ludendorff's resolve. Do you know what I've decided? The professor asked. Maddox shook his head. Batron is the answer. You hinted about that before, Maddox said. I still don't understand. I've shown you the synthetic. His head, his brain core is in ribbons. You likely committed the correct action in destroying him, Ludendorff said. I don't dispute that. No, that part doesn't matter. Captain, I'm feeling giddy, because I'm going to attempt a thing that I've never attempted before. This is an opportunity of a lifetime. Do you realize how seldom the voyage worth it? I have found an amazing laboratory, Captain. With it, would you like to witness a miracle? Yes, Maddox said, becoming intrigued. The professor wasn't trying to hide this. Maybe he should encourage him in that. What are we going to do? You'll have to give me Batron's remains. Done, Maddox said. Once more, Ludendorff raised his eyebrows. He rubbed his hands a moment later. Fine. Finally, the professor had a sealed laboratory inside the Nexus. It had bulkheads, power sources, 
and many builder machines stacked and arranged under Ludendorff's direction. He had builder tools, liquids, precision equipment, and screens everywhere. Maddox, Ludendorff, and Galleon were alone in the lab. None of them wore spacesuits or combat armor. The air was pure, and it was pleasantly quiet in here. Batron's sliced head and brain case lay on a table in neat but separated arrangement. Ludendorff looked meaningfully at the captain. Now, sir, I shall begin an operation of great delicacy. If only Dana were here. The professor frowned, shaking his head. She is not here. I must do this alone. Andros could help you, Galleon suggested. Ludendorff let his chin drop against his chest as he considered that. Finally, he looked up with a smile. That is an excellent idea, Galleon. Captain, is that all right with you? Maddox nodded. Galleon, Ludendorff asked. Could you? I'll call him, Maddox said, who pulled a hand calm out of his pocket. 74 minutes later, Andros Crank, the Kaikaus chief technician, walked through the airlock. Ludendorff and Andros began to confer. Afterward, the chief technician went to a console and activated it. Andros kept activating more screens. Ludendorff did likewise on the other side of the laboratory. Maddox grew bored by the procedure's number of limbs. Maddox raised his head and rubbed his eyes, sliding off his stool to observe the process. The metallic limbs seemed to pluck the pieces from Batron's severed head and knit them into a new hole. It was an odd performance. Andros bathed the newly built head in a strange light, switching colors from time to time. Where did Ludendorff learn to do this? Maddox whispered to Galleon. That is an excellent question, sir, the hollow image said. I do know power was gone. It is fine now, sir, Galleon said. You can look. Maddox removed his hands and turned around to see Ludendorff and Andros crowded around the table with Batron's head. The synthetic's eyes were shut and the lips pressed together. Batron, Ludendorff said in a hoarse voice. I order you to open your eyes. Maddox waited expectantly, but nothing happened. Batron, Ludendorff rode to the synthetic's temples. What are you doing? Batron asked. I do not approve of this. In fact, I demand. Ludendorff nodded to Andros. The chief technician activated a bank of machinery. They whirred into life, sending repeated shocks through the wires attached to the electrodes taped to the synthetic's temples. Batron cried out as if in pain. Barbaric, Galleon muttered. Is this truly warranted, sir? He asked Maddox. I'm not fond of torture, Maddox said slowly. Ludendorff must have heard that. This is not torture, I assure you. No, no, the pain, Batron said. Please make them stop, Captain. Batron does not have any active pain sensors on his skin, Ludendorff said, as Andros and I deadened them. This is merely subterfuge on the synthetic's part. I believe there is a higher function, Batron screamed, although he abruptly quit. There. Ludendorff said, I think we achieved a breakthrough, he told Andros. Let's hope so, the chief technician said as he mopped sweat from his face. Batron blinked several times and then stared at Ludendorff. The power surges will no longer be necessary, he said in an even voice. I am at your disposal. Ask, as I sense you desire answers. Indeed, Ludendorff said. This is true. Let us begin with a test. Certainly, Batron said. How did you cause Starship Victory to travel 10,000 light years in a single bound? The professor asked. I am accessing memories, Batron said. As an aside, I am surprised I retain these memories, as the captain's mutilation should have rendered that impossible. Under ordinary circumstances, you are correct, Ludendorff said. You are witnessing builder technology in action, however. It was a complex procedure, I assure you, but that is beside the point. It almost feels as a statement, Batron said. But you have a point about my cybertronic brain accepting programming. Yet the advanced programming combined with the elite cybertronics has given me actual sentience. 
A moot point, Ludendorff said. Hardly, Batron said. At least, that is, if one has ethics concerning how one should treat another living being. Ludendorff looked up at the ceiling, perhaps counting to ten. When he was done, the professor said, You've agreed you have a sex. Now we are getting somewhere. I believe we will learn the full scope of what has transpired. I suspect we shall also learn Lisa Myers's objective and what the Rull androids are really attempting. This is amazing, Maddox said, impressed with Ludendorff. The hauler holds a builder? Ludendorff dipped his head as if someone had told him he'd played an excellent concerto on the violin. Now, Batron, the professor said as he took a seat at the table. It's time we to speak about such things. I know, Ludendorff said. Don't let it trouble you. You cannot resist my truth serum. There is no serum, Batron said. You sent shockwaves through me and used other processes to retrain my brain, to reprogram it. The process isn't the issue, Ludendorff said. I'm interested in your master, his terrible situation, and how you think the Yon Soth hoped to yishin. It's time you made a confession. Yes, think of me as your priest and start confessing. Chapter 67 Batron began to talk and it lasted for far longer than Maddox or possibly even Ludendorff expected. The synthetic had been part of a builder's personal team. That had been more than 1,000 years ago, Earth, immobilizing the crew, which included the builder. What does a triple curvature time displacement strike even mean? Ludendorff asked. In this instance, that for over 1,000 years we existed in an immobilized status, Batron said. Then, the old one's hallucination wave struck us and the stasis enveloper. Did the Yon Soth realize what would happen? The few machines that still ran on the glorious Kent suggest he did. For, as we awakened, the hallucinations struck each of us. Do you know what it is like having a nightmare in your mind? realizing it is a nightmare, but being unable to resist its effect. It is a horrible experience. I do not wish it on anyone. You awoke deep inside the atmosphere of Albatross 7, asked Ludendorff, and with a plan already in our minds to help annihilate humanity, Batron said. Lisa Myers insisted that after the humans, in all their variations, were gone, that we could revive our master. The builder still lives. Exists might be the better term, Batron said. We are his personal security team. That had always been our prime function in some manner. I do not understand how I can be telling you this. I believe something unwarranted is happening in my mind to force me to speak. L Ludendorff said. I mean the supermetals planet, of course, Batron said. We need the supermetals to repair our machines aboard the glorious Kent. We need them in order to revive the builder. The... Batron abruptly stopped talking. What were you going to say? It is of no import, Batron said. Something is happening in his brain, Andros said, who stared at a screen. It's some kind of energy buildup, an excess, I think. You must, ordered voice. Are more juggernauts gathering there? Batron nodded, seeming unable to speak the words. What is the exact master plan to annihilate humanity? Ludendorff asked. Batron stared at Ludendorff. One could almost see the wheels turning in his cybertronic brain as an interior struggle took place. Then, the tiniest of smiles played on the synthetic's lips. We have to get out of here. Andros shouted, the buildup in his core might trigger an explosion. A blaster hum sounded, and a beam drilled into Batron's forehead. The beam punched through the metal skin, and as Maddox raced across the chamber, the synthetic's head detonated like a grenade. 
Chapter 68 Maddox dragged Professor Ludendorff to the floor as Batron's head exploded. The blast sent shrapnel spinning in many directions, shredding machines, which caused more explosions. From on the floor, Ludendorff, right, he said. Let's get going, Professor. We'll tackle the hyperspatial tube after we get Andros onto victory. But before we start any of that, thank you. What you did in here borders on the miraculous. In my estimation, you really are a genius. Despite himself and his dislike of Maddox, Ludendorff grinned, preening even as he nodded in agreement with the captain. Chapter 69 Andros crank to a shuttlecraft. From there, Keith had rushed him to the starship. A waiting med team had rushed the stout Kai Kaus to medical. Two days after the incident, Andros had rejoined Galleon, the special science team, and Ludendorff aboard the Nexus. On the fifth day, Andros and Ludendorff had spent 14 and a half hours adjusting and recalibrating the hyperspatial tube mechanism. At the end of that time, the space-suited professor had sat before a gargantuan screen with many exotic computers purring around him. Galleon stood in attendance, checking various relays upon request. I don't know, Ludendorff had told Maddox. I think I can do it, but this is going to be a rough tube journey. The main hyperspatial mechanism is almost burned out. When we have it powered up, the Nexus might explode. We might survive, or we might die in the blast. I'd call it a 50-50 proposition. Make sure the Nexus doesn't explode. Cross seven. Roll androids hidden throughout the Commonwealth. And, and what? Asked Ludendorff. Exactly, Maddox said. According to Batron, the Yon Soth goal was human extinction. Did the old one on the Forbidden Planet desire revenge for what had happened? That's the most likely motive I can think of, Ludendorff said. We were killing him. He wanted to kill us back. An eye for an eye, you could say. Maddox nodded. Can raw androids with super metal enhanced weapons annihilate humanity, and that includes the new men? Hmm, that's an interesting point. I don't see how. Myers, through Prime Minister Hampton, attempted to start a war between the new men and the Commonwealth. That would have bloodied both of us, but it still doesn't seem like it would have been enough to ensure human extinction. I see what you're saying. Where's the next shoe going to drop, eh? What's that supposed to mean? Ludendorff grinned. A man lit the device an incredibly important piece of Star Watch equipment. This is Captain Maddox. Do you hear me, Lord High Admiral? Maddox waited, but heard no response. That's strange, he told Galleon. Someone should be in attendance over there. Hello? Came the Lord High Admiral's voice. Is this Captain Maddox? Yes, sir, Maddox said. We've been far away, sir, in the Scutum Centaurus spiral arm, if you can believe it. Now we're in the Tau Ceti system. We're hurrying to Earth as fast as we can, but I have something important to tell you. I'm sure it was a true odyssey. Although I also have to add, you've been gone just long enough for the situation to ripen. You don't have to do this, Maddox said. We can help you with your stasis frozen builder. You help me. Surely you're joking. Maddox debated with himself. Was Myers motivated solely by the yawn soth ray? Was there another agency at work? Builders shape and construct and underestimating her all along. Maddox didn't want to hear that. You should be careful how much more you say, Galleon said. She may be able to trick you into revealing more than you should. Are you still there, Captain? Asked Myers. Once more, Maddox picked up the microphone. Let us help you, he said. During our various missions, we've had encounters with builders. They've given us their blessing each time. That wasn't true, but she likely didn't know that. I'm sure we can rid you of the Yon Soth hallucination. I'm sure you're desperate, Myers replied. What did you say earlier? Hmm, you're in the Tau Ceti system? Thank you. Now I know exactly how much time we have left to strike. If you'd made it back sooner, Earth might have stood a chance. Now, with the forces Star Watch has in the solar system, 
Myers chuckled throatily. You aren't going to be in time, Captain, although you might just make it in time to see Hellburners scorch your planet. Time. The indication was that in some fashion, Dr. Myers could block the long-range builder com. That was a devastating power. He spoke with Ludendorff about the Myers conversation and later with Meta. Myers as much as said that she regards herself as the old one, Meta said in their quarters. The key phrase was, you caused my planet to wither under hellburners and asteroids. Now I shall do the same to you. Maddox nodded. The statement had been troubling him. Maddox nodded. The new men despise weakness, and they're among the most opportunistic of people. Meta glanced at him sharply. Are you suggesting I'm opportunistic like them? Maddox asked. Well, sometimes, Meta said. Maddox slid off the bed and began to pace. Yes, I am part new man. I can't deny it. Should I thank my father for that? He raped my mother. Meta jumped off the bed, hurrying to him, hugging him as hard as she could, which made Maddox wince. Ought to learn the reason. Do you truly know that your father raped your mother? Meta asked softly. She had been watching his face. Maddox looked at Meta anew, and he frowned. I've always believed it. My mother fled a new man birthing center. I do know the new men are domineering and think of themselves as the lords of creation. Many of them treat their wives and concubines poorly. Why else did my mother flee unless she hated my father? Why would she hate him unless he'd raped her? For 3.21 light years away from a parked orbit, Valerie sat at her station as Keith readied for the last jump. Maddox sat impatiently in his chair. Sir, Valerie said, if Dr. Myers was able to block the long-range builder comm and impersonate the Lord High Admiral, a synthetic likely impersonated Admiral Cook, Galleon said, interrupting and correcting her. Fine, fine, Valerie said. Either way, isn't it possible that Myers has blocked the Lord High Admiral from communicating with us? And even more, might have impersonated you, sir? Maddox frowned. The possibility exists, he said slowly. What might Myers have said as you, Valerie asked. Or had a synthetic say as the captain, she said in Galleon's direction. I have already computed the likeliest possibility of what was said, Galleon replied. Clearly, Myers must want victory destroyed. Thus, so that's it, Maddox said, interrupting as he jumped up. Kill us on sight. If we just appear in Earth orbit or near Earth orbit, droids and the juggernauts. Granted, Star Watch's home fleet might have fewer warships than his wives. Yet, as long as the destroyer is parked near Earth, how can any number of upgraded juggernauts hope to win a set piece battle against Star Watch? Maddox frowned for only a moment. He straightened abruptly. Myers will use android or synthetic lookalikes to hijack the destroyer. I see you understand the possibilities, Ludendorff said. The juggernauts, combined with the destroyer, could not only wipe out the home fleet, but obliterate all the solar system's planets. That would be tit for tat in the Jan Soth's ring of eyes. Androids are going to make or have already made a stab to hijack control of the destroyer, Maddox said, believing it even more by stating the obvious move. If true, the professor said. Maddox bent his head in furious thought. We have no more time to waste. We have to get home and warn. Maybe at this stage, warning is the wrong plan, Ludendorff said, interrupting. Maybe we should appear as close to the destroyer as possible and send boarding marines to recapture it. That bumps up against another problem, Maddox said. That Star Watch is likely loaded for bear and will fire on victory as soon as we come out of the star drive jump. Our present situation counts as a dilemma, Ludendorff agreed. If the androids are already aboard the destroyer, we don't want them to begin fighting until we can warn the home fleet and they can set up to fight the destroyer. Maddox shook his head, had aided in countless genocide campaigns waged by the nameless ones through their cycles of existence. That had given the ship a miasma of doom. The very armor, the strange corridors, oozed with the grim feeling of death. Human crews could not withstand the ship's aura for long, without literally going mad. 
That meant many crew rotations, and it also meant that most of the time the destroyer was empty, a museum piece in the warning. Commodore Dumas was a large, overweight man with long, non-regulation hair. He wore many heavy rings on his fat fingers, and his Star Watch uniform hung on him loosely like a great tunic. He had dark, cunning eyes, and for all his girth and unsoldierly appearance, he had fought splendidly at the Forbidden Planet and during the first swarm invasion. Captain Maddox, Dumas said, order your people to place you under arrest. Failure to do so will result in your ship's immediate destruction, android-controlled human. But the words had been said, and it was too late to take them back. On the main screen, Commodore Dumas heaved himself straighter on his command chair, twisted, and shouted, He knows! Start the attack! Destroy victory! Andros, Maddox said, I need the shields up now. Give me 30 more seconds, sir, a desperate Andros said. Valerie, patch me through to the picket leader, or connect me to any of the picket vessels, Maddox said. The Essex is jamming our communications, sir, Valerie said. They have advanced jamming equipment, too. I've started a burn through, but that will take time. Maddox made a snap decision. Keith, start moving us away from the Essex and away from the destroyer. We don't have much motive power yet, mate, Keith said. But aye, aye, whatever you want. Sir, Galleon said, might I suggest antimatter missiles? If you launch and ignite, we will all perish. But that will stop the androids from the Essex reaching the destroyer. The picket ships have started firing, Valerie said. Fusion beams have begun burning into our hull armor. Strike fighters are leading an attack wave, Keith said. Bombers are heading out, Maddox said. The Essex is full of androids. They're attempting to hijack the destroyer and attack Earth in combination with upgraded Rull juggernauts. Are you mad, son? Cook shouted. We know about your treachery. It's time to surrender. The idea about my so-called treachery is Dr. Lisa Myers' is doing, sir. Maddox said as calmly as he could. She's a Methuselah woman. The big old admiral in his white uniform stared at Maddox as he absorbed the news, finally groaning. The Lord help us. We don't need more of them around. But how can I believe you? Maddox shook his head. You have to go with your guts, sir. This mission has been full of lies and subterfuges. Remember how Lisa Myers foisted Hampton on us? and he tried to get you to start a war with the new men? Myers wants to wage a genocide campaign against us. The old one on the Forbidden Planet is the source of this attack, sir. That's why it's been so underhanded all along the line. Through the blizzard on the main screen, Cook stared at Maddox harder than before. Do what you think is right. I can't believe I'm actually saying this, Cook told him. But you are the die far, and Commodore Dumas is indeed taking an emergency crew to the destroyer. We've gotten warning about juggernauts coming from Alpha Centauri. That's why Dumas is making the run to the destroyer. Captain, cripple the Essex if you have to, but don't stop until they do. Don't let androids board the destroyer. That's an order. Chapter 74 Matic destination indicated. With the Essex's destruction, communication between Admiral Cook and Maddox became easy. Victory and the destroyer were midway between Venus and Earth's orbital paths, so there was little time lag between Cook on Earth and Maddox. I'm sending another crew, a human crew this time, to the destroyer, Cook said. The big old man sat in his study with several secretaries in the background. It will take the crew time to reach the killer and time for them to check ship systems and get it operational. We may not have the time, Maddox said. He was in his ready room with Galleon in the background. Son, I do what I can how I can. I'm not a magician, nor am I a die far. The concept is highly overrated, sir, Maddox said. I used my builder comm device, Cook said. The scanner crew on Pluto has studied the Alpha Centauri system. They found the supermetals planet and managed to zero in on it. Someone was mining it. They're gone, though. There's no sign of androids or juggernauts. That means the android fleet is already on the move. For once, Maddox held his peace. He didn't have a good enough poker face, though. Spit it out, Cook said. You want to tell me something? With your permission, sir, I told you to spit it out, son. Now get to it. We have to destroy the android fleet if it exists, Cook said, interrupting. If it exists, sir. I suggest, Maddox sat up. I wonder if it's possible to design a cloaking device able to deceive a builder scanner. 
Oh, Cook said, that would be awful. That would mean, the old man cocked his head. How do you come up with these hairy scenarios? I think what I would do in their place, given their objectives. Dr. Myers is a Methuselah woman. I suspect she was the chief servant to a builder. That was over 1,000 years ago. Yes, she must have access to incredible technology. She must know more about builders than any human alive. Very well, you sold me on the possibility. The juggernauts might have advanced cloaking good enough to- I, sir? Maddox finally asked. Cook raised his head. He looked tired and old. I'm not all right, the admiral said. There are too many variables and unknowns. If I guess wrong, Earth might die under a hail of hellburners. It's starting to sound as if Dr. Myers wanted us to trap her on Jupiter. That was the beginning of her plan. Maybe to pull part of the home fleet's warships there, to separate our fleets into manageable chunks. I'd call it a conmural would be doing in the meantime with the home fleet. In the old days, he used Brigadier O'Hara, telling her his ideas to give to the Lord High Admiral. Could he use Stokes the same way? They were going to find out. Chapter 75 Lieutenant Colonel Stokes made it onto victory. Seven minutes later, the starship used its star drive jump, appearing in the asteroid belt near Ceres. The long round at his right hand dug in a coat pocket and pulled out a pack of stem sticks. He stuck a stem stick in his mouth and inhaled it into life. Maddox debated telling the lieutenant colonel to put that out. He didn't want his people having to deal with stem sticks smoke on top of everything else. But Maddox kept quiet about the smoke for the moment. After several puffs, Stokes said, the juggernauts might use the Mercury Lomber point. They will have taken a circuitous route from Alpha Centauri to reach that point. But if they run off half cocked like you do most of the time. Maddox thought of several things to say at once. What he did say was this, Lieutenant Colonel, you've pegged me, but that isn't about me. Dr. Myers is a Methuselah woman. She was also the personal assistant to a builder. Myers is cunning. She's going for the throat from the get-go. We can't let her get the upper hand even once. If the juggernauts destroy the destroyer, can the home fleet finish off the android fleet? Stokes stared at Maddox as he puffed his stem stick. Do you know that you're the most annoying person in Star Watch? I fail to see what the brigadier ever saw in you. Saw, Maddox said with a tinge of panic. Is she dead? What? asked Stokes. No, what makes you say that? Maddox shook his head, relieved. It doesn't matter. Stokes gave him a funny look and finally dropped the stub onto the deck plates, using the bottom of his shoe to grind it out. That struck Maddox as a filthy habit. Sir, Keith said, we're near the series Lomer point. Maddox raised an eyebrow to Stokes. I can't believe this, the lieutenant colonel muttered. The intelligence officer began to pace as he kept shaking his head. It's my ship, Maddox said. I'll take full responsibility for my actions. That's just it, Stokes said. I'm here to keep you responsible. Oh, hell, he finally said. You're logical when you want to be. Yes, let's race to the Mercury jump point. I just hope Cook doesn't bust me back to Major when this is all over. Right, Maddox said. Mr. Maker, aye, aye, mate, Keith said. I was listening. Now we're off to Mercury. Chapter 76 Starship Victory waited like a shark, prowling near the Mercury Lomer point. Valerie, Andros, and Galleon all watched their sensors carefully, looking for any sign that cloaked juggernauts were coming through or had already been this way shot before boarding. It played havoc with his organs, and he would need to sleep long and hard for a week after this. But that was okay because the shot gave him a boost that would resist the fold lag. The fold fighter didn't have the same energy boost, but it was a specially designed vessel with features that gave it a faster recovery time than other vessels. Are you ready? Galleon asked. What the? Keith shouted, startled by the hollow image's appearance inside his fighter. I am sorry, Keith, Galleon said. Did I startle you? Don't do that again, mate. 
All right, Galleon, you told me the message, now get lost. Ah, that is an idiom for leave. Galleon vanished as Keith's hands blurred over the controls. A second later, the fold fighter folded and reappeared at the designated position. Keith raised his head, pulled a lever, releasing the missile from the clamps, and began activating the fighter for another fold in order to get the hell out of here. That took time, though, as the fighter wasn't as ready as its ace. Then, bam, the Tim penetrate that to see if there was something else. They had to wait for the whiteout to dissipate. When it did, seven juggernauts, Mallory said from her station. That's my count. Andros, Maddox asked from his seat. Do you confirm? I do, sir, the Kai Kaus said. I do not, Galleon said. I count nine juggernauts. Where? asked Valerie. Galleon spit out several coordinates. Confirmed, Valerie said, checking her panel. Yes, there are nine juggernauts, sir. Maddox saw the first one. It was a massive, oval-shaped warship 20 kilometers in diameter. Nine of them meant the android fleet had more mass than the destroyer did. Each juggernaut had Iridium-Z hull plating, making it the second best armored warship around. The electromagnetic shield of the juggernaut he watched was black, but getting brighter instead of collapsing from the antimatter blast. Could the shield have withstood a direct antimatter detonation? If that was true. We found the asteroid fleet, Stokes said, but on a bigger scale. The androids will be ready for the fold fighters this time. Maybe, Cook said. We're going to find out. Now listen here, Captain. I have specific instructions about your part in the plan. I don't want you sniping at their flanks like a wolf. You are to immediately jump back to the destroyer. Every other starship in the solar system of the star drive jump is going to join you there. We're going to fight this battle as a team. The rest of the warships are heading at top velocity for Earth. But if we lose that destroyer before it can tangle with the juggernauts, then we're going to lose the entire solar system. Yes, sir, Maddox said. Now, son, I'm serious about you heading back. Victory has firepower and good shielding and hull armor. It will be as good as an augmented battleship. I'm going to be out there soon, arriving via fold fighter. I want your starship in my formation. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir, Maddox said. Then get back upstairs to your bridge. Cook said, we know the score. Now we're going to discover the outcome. Victory gathered more data, holding back from jumping directly to the destroyer. That was per Maddox's orders. What did Cook say? Stokes asked on the bridge. That we leave here at the very last minute, Maddox said calmly. Until then, we're to gather data and launch every antimatter missile we have left at them. Cook said that? Asked Stokes. You don't believe me? Maddox asked, knowing that was the wrong question the second he said it. Stokes studied the captain. No, he finally said. Maddox shrugged. Yes, sir, he said. The captain cleared his throat. There's been a change in plans. The lieutenant colonel is ordering us back to the destroyer now. In violation of the Lord High Admiral's orders? Asked Valerie from her station. Lieutenant, Stokes asked her with the lift of an eyebrow in Maddox's direction. Would I violate orders? Valerie glanced at a stoic Maddox. Oh, she said. I see. Launch three antimatter missiles first, Maddox said. Yes, sir, Valerie replied. Several times, frowned, and finally said, Earth may have just run out of luck. Then it's time to make our own luck, Maddox said. Helm, get ready to jump to the destroyer. We're going to join the rest of the home fleet, so we take on the Rull Armada. Chapter 78 Things did not look good for the divided home fleet, the destroyer, or Earth. Nine Rull juggernauts built up velocity, straining to reach the destroyer before the crew powered up all the alien systems. The huge oval-shaped vessels showed greater acceleration than any of their kind had during the first swarm invasion. That, too, had to be due to the installed supermetals that improved so many facets of a machine, this time the main engines and thrusters. Nine vast warships 20 kilometers in diameter surely held what was left of the androids that used to live in human space. At least that's what Maddox argued, class being the newest. The fleet also had Starship Victory, two attack cruisers, 
an older carrier, two ultra-slow monitors, and 15 destroyers. There were two ancient battleships without star drive heading in-system from Jupiter along with nine more cruisers, another carrier, 13 destroyers, and 21 corvettes or escorts, but they would arrive a little later. Even combined into one fleet, this was too few warships to defeat nine new and super metals, but it won most of the time. This is definitely a surprise assault. Fortunately for us, Captain Maddox discovered the plan before the android synthetics and the Methuselah woman Lisa Myers could get a lock on victory. I know you had help, Captain. You have the strangest but one of the finest crews in Starwatch. Today, I hope all of us meld to the same degree that Captain Maddox has melded his band of misfits. We're fighting for Earth. That means we could be fighting to keep the Commonwealth together so humanity can face alien dangers as one, united in survival. The enemy is attempting to splinter humanity into many competing factions. Well, by God's grace, we're not going to let that happen. Cook picked up a glass of water and took several sips. He looked tired, but determined. We're all expendable, every damn one of us. We have to buy the destroyer precious time. We have to hurt the juggernauts, so when the awful primary beam opens up, it can smash them into atoms one after another. If that destroyer beam burns battleships while completing its mission, oh well. We'll have done our duty and died well. Cook scanned his commanders. Is there anyone who disagrees with that? No one spoke up. Then, let us resolve to fight harder than we ever had. Let us also bow our heads. Yes, I pray in your glorious name, O Lord God Almighty. Amen. Amen, Admiral Georgia Raker said loudly. At that point, the meeting was over, and the assembled commanders hurried to get to the hangar bay and back to their ships. Chapter 79 The fold fighter pilots were ready to lead their fragile tin cans into the thick of the fight. This time- They're replying, sir, Valerie said. Maddox straightened just a little more as he looked at the main screen. Abruptly, a chrome-colored, metallic rull android stared at him. It was just like last time in the Alpha Centauri system and almost as intimidating. Once, that android had worn clothes and pseudo-human skin. Once, that android had attempted to mimic men and blend into human society. A builder had fashioned the android long ago for an entirely different purpose than the thing attempted. Captain, that you will fail in that Sure I will, Maddox said. And do you know where Lisa Myers is now? Zon Ten stared at him. She's gone to the Super Metals planet. She's raiding it for oars. She's going to revive the builder on her own and tell him whatever story puts her in the best light. You can believe she's double-crossing you. What a fool you are. If you are correct about her actions, we will hunt down the Methuselah woman. No, you won't, he said. You're a peach, Captain, a true peach. Put out that stem stick, Maddox said. Stokes raised his eyebrows as the two locked stairs. Finally, the lieutenant colonel plucked the smoldering stem stick from his mouth and mashed it against the sole of one of his shoes, dropping the crushed butt onto the floor. Happy, asked Stokes. Instead of answering, Maddox stood and went to Valerie, wondering when the shooting would start. got lucky if dying in an antimatter fireball was luck. The flash incinerated the pilot and his vessel and then struck juggernaut shields. That was the break, likely scrambling juggernaut sensors. More appearing tin cans managed to detonate their missiles. The blasts hammered the incredibly tough shields with direct antimatter fury. Even super metal enhanced generators couldn't produce a shield that could take repeated antimatter blows. That, it turned out, was the answer about how to knock down such a powerful shield. Use many antimatter blasts in a row to do it. 
Sir, Fighter Commander Anson said, I have a report. A juggernaut shield just went down. Keep hammering, Cook told him. On the Kaiser Wilhelm's main screen, it looked as if Anson's eyes filmed up as he reported from his HQ. The attack is killing my men, Lord High Admiral. I can knock down more shields and maybe penetrate hull armor, but that could kill everyone in my command. Cook swallowed uneasily, feeling as if his chest was hollowing out. This was the He was in charge. He would give the order that caused many good men to die. Send in your fighters, Commander, and have them launch the missiles at point-blank range. That is an order. Anson saluted and turned away. Cook slumped back in the command chair. He felt old, damned old, and he understood a little more why Admiral Fletcher had resigned after the butcher's battle at the Forbidden Planet. Was he getting too feeble for high command battle formation, but it still meant heavy combined firepower directed at one vessel. Incredibly, or maybe the juggernaut shield was still weak from the former antimatter blasts, the targeted shield went black faster than anyone would have expected. Then the enemy shield collapsed. There were cheers on Victory's bridge. Maddox sat forward, his stare laser-like, as he willed the wounded juggernaut to explode. I feel like a hyena trying to bring down a bull elephant, Maddox muttered. One thing was sure, the jug bomb, pieces hurled in every direction. More than half the android fleet had died to the fold fighters and ad hoc fleet. But the enemy lasers had not been idle during all this. As the fifth juggernaut detonated, laser cannons sliced and diced three battleships, two attack cruisers, and the carrier. For one dead juggernaut, the androids destroyed half the human fleet, trying its fancy flank attack. Zon-10, in his flagship, absorbed the information inside. Is the destroyer, sir, a sensor expert interrupted. The destroyer has begun to move. That would indicate the crew has completed its warm-up. I estimate that the primary beam will soon prepare for firing. Zero in on the destroyer, Zon-10 said. Use tertiary cannons on the human warships. We must annihilate the destroyer if our future worlds would know safety. The other androids did not complain, did not cheer, did not do anything, but carry out Zon Ten's new orders as they bore a few more precious seconds to fully activate. The Admiral vanished from the screen, and the space scene reappeared. For several seconds, no one spoke on Victory's bridge. You heard the man? Maddox finally said with unnatural calm. Lieutenant, make the calculations. White-faced, Valerie turned to her board, her fingers tapping. She and everyone else knew that this was a death sentence. The longer she tapped, the more her shoulders hunched. The destroyer was even tinier than before. We jumped in the opposite direction, Galleon said. Instead of jumping ahead of the juggernauts, we went farther behind them the same distance, and we are not alone, Captain. Along with victory was the Kaiser Wilhelm, the Octagon, a half-crippled cruiser, and three destroyers. There was no evidence of the Monitor or the other remaining vessels or bombers. Wait, Valerie said. Look at the wreckage. Where? asked Maddox. The juggernauts are smashing through ship wreckage, sir, Valerie said. Some of the other ships must have successfully jumped in front of the androids as ordered, but we didn't. People will think we're cowards. Never mind that, Maddox snapped. How did this happen? Valerie hadn't heard him. She still stared at the main screen. Their appearance did nothing to halt the juggernaut's advance. That is imprecise, Stokes said. The Admiral wanted the juggernauts to concentrate on the appearing vessel so the enemy would stop just for a moment anyway, firing at the destroyer. Look at the destroyer. It's of a feeling she had something to do with our jump deflection. Chapter 83 From victory, Galleon and Valerie scanned the battlefield. They found no indication of cloaked ships or devices that could cause star drive jumps to deflect in the wrong direction. If the juggernauts contained such devices, they are gone now, Galleon said. Maddox was troubled nonetheless. What had caused their ships to deflect? Ah, Stokes said, thank you. Maddox was exhausted. He was sure all the survivors were tired and demoralized as well. 
They had won the battle, but at such a grim cost. Starwatch no longer owned a destroyer, and the fleet had been whittled down yet again. They had beaten the androids. The menace should be over. But was it? There was a mystery here. Maddox's eyes narrowed. Ludendorff was in his science lab. He appeared, gave him a timid smile. Keith laughed and slapped the helm with his right hand. We did win. You're right, mate. I mean, sir, we beat the living tar out of the androids. There's no doubt about it, sir. We're the best. Maddox nodded, echoing Keith. We're the best, Mr. Maker. Never forget that. Keith laughed again. Andros Crank slumped back in his chair at the science station. You don't think there are more androids left, sir? Maddox shot of them. They were tired, but maybe not quite as demoralized as a minute ago. Now, though, he had to deal with Ludendorff. What had the professor been up to in his science lab? Don't let your guard down just yet, Maddox said. But know that the worst is over. We came through again, even if by the skin of our teeth. Stokes cleared his throat. Yes, Maddox asked the lieutenant colonel. The Lord High Admiral wants to speak to you and the professor from your ready room, Stokes. The professor set down two stools beside a small open box. I've been thinking, Ludendorff replied. Thinking? Maddox eyed the spread out items and laid down tools. What have you been thinking about? Events. If that was true, why had Ludendorff been holding tools? Maddox pulled out a chair and sat down upon it. The professor wanted to be mysterious, clearly, or he was hiding something. Maddox was almost too tired to play the game. If the professor wanted to... Maddox noticed the professor eyeing him sidelong. What is it? Maddox asked. Ludendorff shook his head as if he didn't know what the captain meant. You're hiding something, Maddox said. Your very bearing screams it out. You're finally making me curious. What nonsense, Ludendorff said. I realize you have all fought splendidly. I paid attention to the battle. Now the androids were gone, or almost gone. Maddox forced himself to even greater alertness. He was tired with the aftershock of hard fighting. Yet now, Ludendorff was playing his usual mind games, forcing him into a battle of wits. Maddox scowled. He wasn't going to let the devious Methuselah man get away with, with whatever Ludendorff was trying to get away with this time. Resolved, Maddox headed back into the science lab. But where did you get a gadget like that? I never heard of deflection technology until the glorious Kent showed up. Do you know what that tells me, Professor? I haven't a clue, Ludendorff said. That you were in communication with Lisa Myers. She must have given you the deflection device. What did you pay for such an item, Professor? I've had just about enough of your accusations. If I had such a device and we indeed deflected, you should be on your knees thanking me that you and your wife are still alive. Would you rather be dead? That's not the point. The hell it isn't, Ludendorff shouted. That's exactly the point. You wanted to play the Teutonic hero like Sigrid and the dragon. You and Cook think alike, fight bravely, and let everyone else take care of the issues afterward. Well, maybe I did save victory. And maybe I realized the Commonwealth needs that old fool of a Lord High Admiral, and thus I pulled the Kaiser Wilhelm to safety along with us. Do you agree? Maddox barely refrained from rubbing his forehead. What have you gotten yourself mixed up in this time, Professor? Ludendorff shook his head before looking up at the ceiling. You still don't understand, do you? I used to be a man, an ordinary man. But long ago, the builders sent servants to Earth. The servants snatched me and took me far away to the builders. They worked on me. They trained, Max asked. Knowledge of our outbound trip, my boy, Ludendorff said. I told her about the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan and about the nexus with the graveyard of spaceships around it. 
You told her the truth about those things? She is a Methuselah woman. She would have detected lies. And you did this during the battle? I did. You think that was a fair exchange? She received more than I did, I realize. Maddox stared at Ludendorff. I, exactly. Ludendorff blinked several times before shuddering. You must kill her, my boy. Kill her before she engineers humanity's death. Wait, I'm supposed to kill her while you trade secrets with her so you can double cross us at a critical instant? I did not double cross us. I saved our collective skins. And you all have clean consciences because I took the burden upon myself. Now, however, I am warning you and I have a meeting with the Lord High Admiral. Ludendorff licked his lips. You're going. Maddox said. You can't squirm out of it this time. The professor's shoulders slumped, and he nodded. When is the meeting? As if on cue, Galleon appeared. Excuse me, gentlemen, there has been a change in plans. The Lord High Admiral is already on his way. He instructed me to listen in on your conversation and to link it to him. He listened as well. What? Ludendorff shouted. That is an outrage. That's an invasion of privacy. Agreed, Galleon said. I still suggest that you get ready to receive the Lord High Admiral and his security detail. They should be here within 20 minutes. Chapter 85 The Lord High Admiral almost seemed frail, as if the towering individual in his white uniform might have twisted and hollowed out. Lord High Admiral Cook sat behind a large desk. His security people were outside the chamber. All he has isn't threat. We destroyed the android fleet, the juggernauts, and I'm about to unleash victory at the super metals planet. But it would seem that Lord Dracos presents a second threat. Could that threat come through, pressuring the emperor of the new men to make another assault upon regular humanity? I doubt it, Ludendorff said. From every indication, that wasn't the direction of Lisa Myers's thoughts. Oh, Cook said. And you're privy to her inner thoughts, are you? I uh, misspoke, Ludendorff said. Did you? Asked Cook as he eyed the professor with some of his former strength. Ludendorff cleared his throat. Now, see here. I don't want to hear it, Cook said, interrupting. I want to preserve the Commonwealth and build up our societal, industrial, and fleet strength. Who knows when the sovereign hierarchy of Leviathan will attempt to use nexuses to reach us? Who knows what secret plan Lord Dracos is attempting to hatch? If you fail to capture Lisa Myers at the Supermetals Planet, Captain, where will she go to stir up trouble against us next? May I make a suggestion, sir? Maddox asked. Cook stared at him before nodding. Regroup the fleet, Maddox said. Rather than putting warships in each system, pick two or three places and mass the fleet there. You don't understand, Cook said. The rumblings and troubles were coming from every direction in the Commonwealth. Mass riots, assassinations, space piracy. It was as if one world after another was going mad. The only thing left was spreading the fleet thin to cover everywhere. I think many of the troubles came from the Yon Soth nightmare ray. Starwatch Marines have been forced to kill tens of thousands of rioters and other troublemakers on a hundred different worlds. Cook frowned. I think the nightmare ray has worn off some. Or maybe those most susceptible to it are dead. But there are indications that many of our troubles were planned and well executed by hidden agencies. If that's the case, Maddox said, that's a job for intelligence and a world's local police force. The fleet protects us from foreign invaders while intelligence and the local police Root out domestic, listen to me carefully, son, Cook said, interrupting and leaning across the desk. I did not call you here to lecture me on my job. I'm the one who called you here to lecture you on your job. Yes, sir, Maddox said. Cook nodded, leaning back again. The worlds were going crazy, or enough people were that the fleet had to step in and keep order. We staved off the worst of the madness, but we haven't found the perpetrators that stirred up chaos for foreign powers. I, uh, have a different 
thought, sir, Maddox said slowly. Cook waited. Perhaps we could have the brigadier running intelligence again, Maddox said. Cook did nothing for several seconds. According to our best intelligence, there are hints concerning Lord Dracos in the Vega system. That's the last place we know he went anyway. And there's something else going on at Vega, too, that ties in with some of the other worlds. For certain, there's a big money leak in the Vega system, helping to fund other rebellions in other systems. Victory might not be the best, son, Cook said, interrupting. You're our best intelligence agent. I need you to check out Vega, too. That's provided you capture or kill Lisa Mott. Besides, the captain needs me if he hopes to catch Dr. Myers, and I can undoubtedly help him crack the Vega case. Cook's nostrils flared. Finally, he faced Maddox. It's your choice, Captain. The professor is treacherous, Maddox said. But he knows a thing or two the rest of us often don't. I can still use him, provided I don't have to put a bullet in his brain first. Ludendorff held his peace, but it looked difficult for him. Good luck, son, Cook said, standing. Cook said harshly, don't say it. Otherwise, I'm summoning my people. Do I make myself clear? A half-abashed Ludendorff gave the barest of nods. Cook stared at the professor a little longer, and finally turned away with a sound of disgust. Go, he said without looking and heaven help you if you ever harm Captain Maddox or his crew. Chapter 86 Victory moved through the Alpha Centauri system, heading toward the super metals planet. Every sensor strained to detect any cloaked vessel or hidden mine. Maddox had been in contact with the Lord High Admiral via the Builder comm device. Cook had been in touch with the people on Pluto running the Builder Scanner. The Glorious Kent had risen from the depths of Jupiter and hauled butt through selected folds, heading toward the Alpha Centauri system. The last sight the people on Pluto had was the Glorious Kent parked might take out the Star Watch missiles. Was Myers enticing him to use the disruptor cannon on Glorious Kent? That seemed probable. Would the disruptor beam deflect back against victory? Galleon, find the rest of the cloaked missiles. We'll concentrate on taking those out first. What about the glorious Kent? Asked Ludendorff. Professor, Maddox said, you stick to your area of expertise and I'll stick to mine. Meaning you don't have a method yet, Ludendorff said. Maddox debated having Marines escort the professor off the bridge, but desires on the main screen. Chapter 87 on the main screen, Dr. Lisa Myers, the Methuselah woman, wore a silver suit like a new man. She did not look like a new man, however. She was stunning in her silver outfit, with her prominent breasts and long blonde hair that framed her breathtaking features. The eyes were the most amazing, compelling, and captive. No, I don't think I do, as I happen to know that look anywhere. You wish to remove my garments and mount me. At least have the decency to admit it. Maddox smiled. Mount you on a wall as a hunting trophy. I suppose you're right. I would like that. Don't be crude. You're my enemy, doctor, as you wish to destroy what I love. It isn't crudity that causes me to speak like this, but simple honesty. You're a menace to civilization. Purified hatred swirled in Myers' eyes. The intensity and suddenness of it shocked the captain into silence. The look was a palpable force that crossed the ether. In that moment, she didn't seem human, but a demon, wearing a human disguise. Do you call your puny society a civilization? Myers mocked. No. You are parasites, scavengers feeding off a greater civilization's petrified carcass. You ape your better turn, and they shall sweep aside your paltry society to make room for something infinitely superior. Can you comprehend my great purpose yet? I see that you're insane, Dr. Myers. I imagine the Yon Soth Ray unhinged your mind. Let us help you. Let us restore your mind. 
Myers laughed, and it had a maniacal edge. You have unwittingly aided me, Captain, by your earlier voyage and what you found. Do not seek to find me right away. I will be gone for a time. But then I shall return, and the glory of the builders will follow. Humanity is doomed, Captain Maddox. They have been allowed this small hour. But the grossness and pettiness of your civilization will soon be washed away in a tide of blood. Is that really you speaking? Or is that the yawn soth in you speaking? The look of purified hatred, a blue nimbus, circled the hauler, and then it seemed as if a bright opening tore in the very fabric of space. Powers swirled there, and the glorious Kent entered the rift. The rift closed, and the ancient hauler was gone. What just happened? Maddox asked. That, Ludendorff said is an excellent question. I suspect it will be some time before I can give you an accurate answer. Her objective, why doubt her on that? Anyway, it's out of our hands for the moment. Ludendorff stirred the beans with his fork and abruptly pushed the plate away. Cook knows about the location of the super metal mine and is sending people to Alpha Centauri. We're finished with it. Now we're supposed to clean up this Lord Dracos affair. I wonder if we'll have as much success against the new man as we did last time we tried to capture him. Maddox became thoughtful. After the glorious Kent had vanished, he'd had Galleon locate the mine on the Thonian planet. Then a survey team had gone down and explored the facility. The mine had still been in working order, although all the storage bins had been cleaned out. Maddox sipped his beer. He'd neither captured nor killed Dr. Myers. He considered her a long-term threat to the Commonwealth, but suspected it might be several years before they saw her again. She was obviously dedicated to her goal, but struck him as someone who might plan more carefully and thoroughly next time. Maddox took another thoughtful sip. The starship was on its way to the Vega system and should reach Vega 2, Pandora, in three days. He'd been reading intelligence files on the situation and now switched topics with Ludendorff bringing up their next assignment. The professor didn't have much to say on the subject, although by the end of the talk, his curiosity seemed to have been piqued. During the journey, Maddox, Galleon, had, I've solved the puzzle. As have I, Galleon said. Nonsense. Ludendorff said. You're claiming to have outreasoned me? That would depend, Galleon said. When did you solve the problem? Does your answer concern Vint Diem? Ludendorff countered. Vint Diem, the professional gambler, Galleon said. Yes, he is clearly a former spacer, adept at using his confound you, you pile of alien circuits and computer programming, Ludendorff said. When did you realize he was Lord Dracos's Pandora agent? I do not believe that Vent Diem is, Galleon said. Aha, Ludendorff shouted. You're not so clever after all. Vent Diem is most certainly Dracos's agent. That's how Dracos is funneling masses of money into his various underworld rebellions. It's quite obvious once you know what to look for. I must protest, Professor, Galleon said. Vint Diem's operation strike me as a spacer ploy to reintroduce. Perhaps if you start your reasoning from the beginning, Maddox said. Ludendorff grinned. It's a good thing for you I've never taken up intelligence work. I could run rings around your brigadier and most probably around you too. No doubt, Maddox murmured. Now, from the beginning. Of course, Ludendorff said. Pay attention, Galleon. Maybe you'll learn something. You have my attention, Professor, the hollow image said. Please proceed. Ludendorff, the crowd would notice. Maddox stood in a vast chamber bigger than any sports stadium. The ceiling was 50 feet high with expensive murals everywhere showing scenes Michelangelo might have painted during the High Renaissance. Maybe 10,000 people played at the roulette craps, blackjack tables, spinners, slots, or other gambling areas. 
This was the high stakes room of the Carlotta Casino on Pandora of the Vega system. It was famous throughout the Commonwealth. Here, billions of credits exchanged hands daily, enough of a percentage going to the house that the high stakes room not only paid the majority of planetary taxes, but the majority of the Vega system taxes as well. The 10,000 or more people were millionaires or higher. All wore expensive garments, some of them outrageously so. Many had personal bodyguards, although none of the thick-necked guards were legally armed, having passed several stiff security scans to make sure. Got clenched, although nothing showed on his face. Are you saying the game's up? Give me that, the man said, holding out his left hand. Of course, Maddox said. He set the analyzer, which had just stopped beeping, onto the man's meaty, outstretched palm. The big man looked at Maddox with surprise. That's it? He asked. No. The man grunted as he arched up onto his toes. He began turning around. Maddox stepped closer yet, grabbing the outstretched wrist that held the small cube. He stopped the man from turning. It took every ounce of the captain's strength to do so. Then he plucked the analyzer from the man's trembling palm. From underneath his bony ridge of brow, the man stared at Maddox, and his mouth moved slackly as if trying to form words. Meta moved from behind the man. She wore an amazing dress of sparkling sequins that showed off her cleavage to great effect. She had a tiny purse made of the same sequined material. She deposited something small into the purse, clicking it shut. That something had a needle on the end, which she just jabbed in the vent. No one had seen him set down the security uniformed man. Maddox bit his lower lip and put a hand in a jacket pocket. Casino security men flowed into the flash area, calming patrons and searching for the source. Nothing more had happened after the one brilliant flare of light. Maddox glanced at the craps table where Vint Diem stood, holding dice. Everyone over there was still looking at the area of the flash. Then someone at the table said something, so the throng turned back to the green felt table, glancing at the shooter. Vint Diem grinned back at them and began shaking the dice in his right closed hand that he held just above his head. It was illegal to hold craps dice with both hands, as some players cheated by switching dice that way. Maddox slid up against a nearby column and took out the analyzer. Would it beep again? It was time to find out. Chapter 90 Maddox fiddled with the cube's tiny controls with Asian origin from Earth. Not that Vint had been born on Earth, in fact, he must have been born a spacer. Many spacers were of Southeast Asian origin. They were also small, like Vint Diem. That he wore dark sunglasses like that could mean he was accustomed to wearing dark goggles. The most damning indicator that the man had been born a spacer was that the analyzer beeped softly in Maddox's hands. This time, Maddox studied the readings. Ludendorff had made the analyzer a few days ago. Personnel would start checking security cameras. But he wasn't too worried. Galleon had already tampered with their systems. It was time to head to Vent Diem, the money man who paid for military-grade weapons and battlesuit shipments that went many places throughout the Commonwealth. Maddox scanned people as he laughed as if he'd drunk too much. That helped him blend in with those around him. His scan did not spot any other hidden guards. He inhaled, shifted mental gears, and adjusted the amp. But you don't know who I am, or who I represent. I do, Maddox said, slipping his left hand into a jacket pocket. He gripped a small stun disc, ready to pull it out and incapacitate Lord Dracos's operative. I am not a hardliner, in your vague terminology the disguised new man said, I am here at the behest of the emperor. For what reason? Asked Maddox. The turbaned spy closed his eyes for just a moment, as if holding himself. But I propose, a moment, the new man said, holding up a palm once more. You are about to suggest things that would not only upset me, but put me in a dreadful position. I do not want to be honor bound to destroy you for insulting me. Thus, I will give you a proposal. Stay out of my way. I will kidnap Vint Diem and take him far from here. In return, the new man looked away. This is quite distasteful, but I serve my emperor. 
He sighed and peered at a spot above Maddox's head. I will now, but not before he told us that Draco's found something in the outer Vega system. May I ask what he found? The exact object or objects elude me, the new man said. You are welcome to look in the outer system, but I doubt you will find any clues. Dracos will have, hmm, disposed of them. That is the reason I desire Vent Diem. He won't know either, the new man said. And before you ask me more, I'll tell you how I know this. Dracos follows standard spy procedures. He will not have let Vent Diem know anything about his greater projects. Why do I feel as if you're being completely honest with me? The emperor recognizes the commonwealth's present weakness. It distresses him as he does not want to entice others into attacking or suggesting we attack the submen again. The emperor is generous to his former enemies. I assure you it has nothing to do with that, the new man said. You, as in the mass of submen, have a reservoir of young and nubile women, ominous. It is, but not for the submen. More about this I will not say. Maddox looked away. You must decide now, the new man said. Accept the Emperor's gift. It is generous and will strengthen the Commonwealth and Star Watch. It will help induce peace longer than otherwise between our dominions. Lord Dracos found something in the outer Vega system. You are repeating what I just told you. Do you have a hint as to what the something might be for item of information? It concerned Lord Dracos's quest. The Emperor's spy believed that Dracos had found the location of Commander Thrax T. Ix's hybrid fleet. What's more, Dracos appeared to be seeking out Thrax in order to make a proposal to the swarm creature. This is it, Maddox told Ludendorff later. This is the second shoe. If Dracos could have brought Thrax's warships together with the Juggernauts, they might have done enough damage to entice the rest of the new men to reinvade the Commonwealth. You could be right, Ludendorff said. A Commonwealth needs peace more than ever. That means we have to stop Dracos from finding Thrax. First, Maddox said, we have to tell the Lord High Admiral about this. It's time to end all the rebellions in the Commonwealth. Then we have to strengthen Star Watch. We've won breathing space, and our yon soth induced enemies did not hit us all at once. We've even managed to work with the Emperor of the New Men. Progress, Ludendorff said. Progress, Maddox agreed. The two men studied each other, and each laughed at the absurdity of the situation. Then Maddox gave orders for Valerie to plot a course for Earth. It was time to give the crew a break while intelligence operatives and police on 23 planets began taking down Dracos's underworld network. Star Watch had won another round in the eternal fight to keep humanity alive, kicking, and free in a harsh interstellar community. I'll talk to you later, Professor, Maddox said, getting up. It's time I told Meta that she can pick a spot to go dancing once we reach Earth. Ludendorff nodded, and he watched the captain leave the bridge. Then the Methuselah man sighed quietly to himself, wondering what Dana was doing on Brahma Three. This has been the Lost Supernova, Lost Starship Series, Book 10, written by Vaughn Hepner, narrated by Mark Boyette, copyright 2019 by Vaughn Hepner, production copyright by Vaughn Hepner. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.